Welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining the first edition of the uh, Swiss Symposium on Blockchain Research organized by the uh, University of Zurich, by the Competence Center on Blockchain by the University of Zurich. We are going to have a full day event that we are going to speak in a second what the program is, but we have a lengthy list of speakers, and in principle, the event finishes at 5 p.m. But I say that the a blockchain of this symposium is organized by the a Blockchain Center. So what is it? In 2017, a set of professors of the University of Zurich recognized two things. First of all, that we had common interest on the area of researching on blockchain. But we recognized immediately a second thing that is perhaps uh, as interesting, which is the fact that we were interested in the topic from a truly interdisciplinary point of view. We were interested in this topic from completely different angles. And this is why we decided to start coordinating our activities inside of the university. Initially, in a, an informal manner, and eventually uh, being supported by the board of the university, by the president, and also by our faculty, we consolidated a competence center on uh, research on the area that has been established this year. And this is particularly important because Zurich, too, this part of Switzerland is perhaps one of the most active uh, areas in the field worldwide. But these kind of initiatives are also expanding and, uh, and are particularly broad in all, in all our country. Going back to the blockchain center, nowadays it is uh, uh, participated by 20 professors from different faculties, from two different faculties, uh, law and business economics and informatics. And we have a very lean structure in which we only have a steering committee composed by five of us. The basic ideas and the basic roles that the blockchain center has at the University of Zurich are three. On the one hand, to foster and coordinate the interdisciplinary research that we do on the area. Second is to create a complete set, a complete gamma of education offerings that range from undergraduate students to industry leaders. And also to serve as a single point of contact between the University of Zurich and peer institutions, and this is the spirit of this uh, symposium, but also to engage with industry and other societal stakeholders, like, for example, regulatory bodies and policymakers. And this is why we have the very varied knowledge creation platform in our University of Zurich. We have from building systems, uh, our consortia of completely disaligned uh, organizations, to understand the regulatory bodies, that uh, regulatory frameworks that uh, uh, are present in this token economics to understand as well the economic functioning of these blockchain-based systems and to understand also from the technical point of view uh, ways that allow for their larger scalability and to understand the technologies themselves. And this is why we started to have a set of activities the first one is the one that uh, reunites us all today, which is a, a regular symposium on blockchain research. I'm going to say a few words about it in a few seconds. But also we have a lecture series that we run regularly in which academics from different uh, parts of the world um, present the most novel advances on, on this area, but always from a complete, from an interdisciplinary point of view. Second, Starting from fall 2019, we are going to have a series of industry talks in which leading firms in the field are going to present their activities, but in an academic environment in which their ideas are going to be challenged. Also, we are starting to host a certificate of advanced studies on the blockchain area in which the interdisciplinary knowledge that we have in the field is going to be presented to industry leaders. So, about the Swiss Symposium on Blockchain Research. This symposium has two main objectives. And as if you see the program, 
I hope that this, they are reflected in the interesting program that we created for today. On the one hand is to have the most, the widest topical coverage on the area. One thing that is very fundamental for us at the University of Zurich is understanding that blockchain-based systems cannot be understood just looking at them from a single discipline, be it technical, law, or economical, or economics. Therefore, the program is completely interdisciplinary and contains talks in the three main areas, and always when, with an interdisciplinary angles. The second important thing is to understand what everybody in this country is doing, therefore to have the widest possible uh, federal coverage uh, in the program that is also well reflected, as you will see in a second. Our idea is to have not only universities, but also universities of applied sciences, but from the complete geography of this country. So, the program is as follows. Now, Paolo Tasca, who is... Uh, from the University College London, is going to present the, the keynote speech. He's not technically, he's also affiliated with the Blockchain Center of the University of Zurich, but he's the executive director of the Center for Blockchain Technologies at the University College London. Then, after the coffee break, we are going to have a session in which first Professor Alexander Berenstein is going to talk about uh, game theoretic models of proof of stake. So it's going to be a talk about uh, economics. Then Professor Weber from our university is going to talk about the regulatory framework in Switzerland of token assets. And finally, before the lunch break, uh, Brian Ford is going to talk about decentralized data protection in next generation blockchains. After the lunch break, Professor Wattenhofer from ETH is going to talk about altruism in blockchain-based systems. Dr. Arthur Chervé uh, from uh, Hochschule Luzern and Imperial College is going to uh, talk about off-chain transactions. Thank you very much. And then Michael Lustenberger, after the coffee break, is going to talk about supply, supply chain uh, approaches uh, based on blockchain technologies. Then Jörn Erburt from Geneva is going to talk about general data protection and blockchains. And finally, Massimo Morini is going to talk about uh, transforming finance. This is the final program that had uh, several unknown elements here and there. So, just to conclude, I want to thank all the people that helped us to organize the, the symposium. First of all, the, uh, the students, also the speakers that allowed us to create this program, and also you all for attending in, into this. And finally, I also would like to give a special thanks to Trust Square, who helped us to support the financing of this event. Thank you very much, and let us start the program with Paolo Tasca. Come in. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Claudio. Thank you for, for the invitation. And it looks like I'm exotic in this room. But indeed, I'm not, because I've been spending six years of my life in Switzerland. Uh, I did uh, uh, most of my PhD and postdoc at ETH Zurich, where I met Claudio, where we started to get a little bit of fun with uh, this crypto world, already back 2020, 2011, with some interesting activities. Um, and then uh, I moved, uh, uh, changed country. And uh, I'm happy to be here as a, an external affiliate of the Zurich Blockchain Center and also in light of the cooperation that we are establishing with, uh, uh, between the UCL CBT, which, uh, which is one of the largest uh, blockchain centers in the world. We count about 160 people at the moment. And the University of Zurich Center for Blockchain Technologies, which, uh, which uh, um, basically we are going to, to, to stress and uh, strengthen in the, next, uh, in the next months and years to come. So what I'm going to talk, uh, I'm trying to be uh, very, uh, very, so to say, uh, uh, precise with the time because it's something that I learned when I came to Switzerland a few years ago to be on time. So uh, what I'm going to talk is about uh, a general overview about uh, uh, where we stand in terms of uh, uh, business evolution, uh, what I call the um, platform capitalism. And uh, it's basically an, an extract from, from an article that I wrote for, for turning points which is the special edition of the New York Times 
and uh, I wrote uh, this uh, issue once a year, and uh, he's telling the new, you know, he's telling about the new challenges, the new, the new on, in different areas, and uh, and, uh, and you can find the piece online if you if you Google it. So, um, uh, what? Uh, sorry. Ah, okay. Okay, good. So, uh, what is going to happen? Uh, basically, I'm going to drive you toward the, what I call the platform capitalism. Basically, what we started, uh, uh, we, need to, we need to consider where we started. We started by a, what is called a pipeline business model, which is basically um, uh, what govern our business model for the last two centuries. Uh, basically, we have the, the producer from one side of the supply chain, and we have uh, the mass cons anonymous mass consumer society from the other side uh, that were basically receiving uh, uh, products and services from the, from the producers. And uh, this is uh, interesting because, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the mass consumer society were basically somehow uh, manipulated or the needs have been uh, engineered by the, by, the, by the corporations. And uh, in this, uh, you know, uh, uh, situation where basically you have uh, these different communities uh, that are now very linked between each other, the only trust uh, one of the major trust providers using that type of business model was the brand. The brand recognition was one of the major basic drivers of uh, consumer behaviors. So the stronger your brand, the higher are your revenues. And the interesting model, uh, the interesting characteristic of this type of models um, basically is that uh, uh, these type of models were basically um, uh, scale, able to scale up by investing in internal uh, resources and uh, basically where the inventory uh, basically uh, appear in the balance sheets uh, of, uh, of the corporations. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is where we, 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 we come from, but with the, with the event of internet, uh, uh, what happened is a transformation, uh, basically uh, a radical change uh, in the business models. I'm not saying that the old, uh, old fashion pipeline business model are basically uh, um, any more in place. They are still uh, basically very active and uh, a dominant part of our, of our business models or economy. But uh, the, uh, the internet technology uh, uh, gave the opportunity uh, to, to new entrepreneurs to design a new business model around a new redefinition of the concept of consumers. So the consumer was started not to be considered anymore as a, a separate type of communities where we basically, as a, as, a, as a business or entrepreneur, we were able to manipulate somehow and provide them some standard products and services, but they started uh, the consumer to be involved into the production process. Uh, they started to integrate more into the production process. And uh, some of the consumers in this started to become a prosum uh, the, the producers. That's the, 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 you know, the word the prosumer that uh, uh, is uh, quite, uh, that is, which is the combination of producer and consumer, which is quite uh, um, uh, used in the, in the US, but not, not only. Uh, so the fact that basically uh, us as a consumer from one side, we started to become uh, basically somehow uh, uh, involved, more involved in the production process. And this uh, type of uh, uh, platform or, or uh, model uh, was basically uh, designed uh, thanks to the internet technology. And uh, the novelty is basically the fact that uh, um, not only information goods, if you think about the, uh, the newspapers, the magazine industry, the publishing industry that's been disrupted somehow with the events of internet, but uh, only uh, also the physical goods, if you think about uh, underutilized assets, uh, so the fact that we have uh, spare rooms that we can uh, put online and we can uh, generate revenue through a platform called Airbnb, or if we have a car and we can use it for for, uh, for, for making extra revenue through, through a platform like Uber and so on and so forth. These type of platforms were basically uh, able to extract revenue uh, by, by putting us together. And differently from, uh, from the pipeline business model, this type of uh, new platform business model uh, scale up not investing uh, in the internal resources, but investing in external resources, by investing in their network. The larger their networks, the larger their revenues. Um, what's happened indeed, uh, you can check in the, 
in the in the balance sheets of most of the of these uh, uh, platform business model, the revenue that indeed they, they generate is not indeed uh, much about uh, uh, selling services uh, or uh, or fees. Uh, you, you you see that there, there's been a shift uh, during the last years from from this type of uh, uh, revenue stream from uh, from from another revenue stream. So basically, the platform started to understood that uh, basically um, we as a user uh, are not. Uh, our, their targets, we become their products, right? And uh, by becoming their product, we, we basically allow them to monetize our data. And uh, the most part of the revenue they generate, uh, if, you, if you look at Google or, or Facebook, for example, they generate revenue through the, through the ads and through the data that they can basically uh, 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 take from us and, uh, and monetize from. Um, so this, uh, this uh, uh, basically um, platform business model, basically, as I said, uh, they have been enabled uh, by these uh, um, ICT and techno-based uh, um, uh, technologies, uh, and uh, and basically uh, um, uh, allow us to um, to be connected in a in a so-called uh, basically uh, platform economy, which is basically. Uh, at uh, uh, almost uh, uh, zero marginal cost. So what's happening here is uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, something uh, is something interesting uh, to observe. So in the in the in the old pipeline business model, uh, two forces were in place. One uh, was the market, uh, which uh, 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 through the price mechanism coordination mechanism. Uh, Basically, we're able to uh, match make uh, the uh, competing sellers with anonymous buyers, and the other one uh, was uh, basically um, uh, hierarchical uh, organizations, uh, through which through the coordination mechanism called legitimate authority, were able basically to organize uh, properly organize uh, uh, labor divisions, uh, the division of the labor force, and uh, and these two mechanisms. Uh, work very well for pipeline business model, uh, but they are not working very well for uh, community-based, uh, knowledge-intensive, open platforms, uh, because they are not able to, uh, to solve the, 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 the production allocation trade-off. So uh, what is coming, uh, what is emerging as a new force uh, is the force of the communities. As I said, the consumer becomes producer. They merge together in the so-called prosumers in this type of new platform business model. And this, the powerful of the community is the powerful of the, of the, of the, of the, of the entrepreneurs. So the larger my community, the larger my revenue. But in this type of new, uh, in this type, in this type of new forces, uh, the coordination mechanism is trust. So how you uh, enforce trust between these peers that are connected between each other? Well. You know, the, the, who controls the platform is basically the legitimate uh, owner of, uh, of the trust, is the trust provider. And therefore, uh, you know, we have seen uh, in the last years uh, an interesting, uh, you know, exercise uh, by this type of uh, uh, tech giants that they are basically uh, becoming, substitu substituting basically the, the traditional institutionalized trust providers and becoming basically the, the keepers of our digital identity and our trustworthiness. So they are basically. Um, uh, providing trust in this uh, new uh, platform business model, where the trust uh, basically as a new coordination mechanism is not substituting price uh, or authority, but it's part uh, of the uh, coordination mix uh, which, uh, which belong to, the, to, these, to these new uh, business models. And, uh, uh, and I'm not talking about something that is, will happen in the future, I'm talking about something that is happening now. This is a statistic that uh, I collected from yesterday, basically, from uh, a source from uh, CB Insights. I downloaded the data from uh, the unicorns companies in the world, and uh, you see that uh, most, more than 60% of the unicorns are basically uh, coming from platform business models. So they are already basically, um, uh, they are already basically uh, generating most uh, of the value in our economy, most of our GDP value. They are basically uh, uh, monetizing our data. And there are some statistics that show basically that uh, by 2025, uh, uh, the GDP uh, 
on, on, uh, for, of those countries that invest uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in data-driven uh, platform business model will increase by 20-25%. So there will be a huge, uh, is, is, is happening a huge transformation uh, from, uh, from the physical goods uh, to, digital, to digital goods. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and what was the interesting uh, innovation in the last century in the, uh, that allowed basically to uh, scale up the supply chain was uh, the invention of the container together with the invention of the barcode. And this, this, this uh, tremendous invention allowed the pipeline business model to scale up uh, globally, but they are not very well uh, uh, fitted in an in environment where there is no physical good, but there is a, a digital goods or digitized goods. So we need to, we need to find a way to, 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 to invent a new smart data containers, and we need a technology for this. Um, but let me, let me see what is happening recently about these tech giants. So what is happening is basically an interesting phenomenon. Uh, which is basically uh, the, uh, loss of the loss of credibility that these uh, 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 tech giants uh, uh, um, have with respect to, the, to their services and their platforms. So um, for the first time uh, in the last few years, you see that uh, the uh, Edelman barometer of trust barometer for the platform business model is, is decreasing. Well, uh, this means that... Uh, you know, we, we start uh, having some fear, we start feeling some fear with respect to these, uh, um, these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these tech giants. There is a sort of disillusion. And, uh, well, and maybe also for some uh, ground reasons. Uh, just look at these statistics. The last, only last year, we, uh, about one billion, one billion of our data has been stolen or compromised. Maybe without us even knowing it. So, and this is increasing. So, okay, if this is basically, uh, you know, uh, the services and, uh, and the results of uh, um, um, giving uh, the, to these uh, tech giants the power to become the, our, uh, the gatekeepers of our trustworthiness, then uh, we, we are certainly not very happy about the results. And, uh, and therefore, uh, there, are, there is a lot of uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, you know um, um, uh, new uh, uh, new thought about uh, alternative solutions to these uh, to these uh, centralized tra platform business models, and uh, and certainly this is uh, uh, not only about uh, uh, the problem about the, the data leakage uh, and the fact that. Uh, uh, sometimes also the algorithms are, are compromised and manipulated. And, uh, and this is interesting uh, to observe. Um, a platform like uh, you know, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, which is basically driving something like 2 point billion uh, users, um, 2.2 billion users, uh, is basically hosting uh, uh, pages that are supporting uh, uh, terrorism groups. They don't they don't, they don't control the contents. The same for Google's. There was a scandal, uh, I think it was uh, one, year, one year and a half ago, uh, about uh, Google search engine, uh, which is somehow derived by the page rank, but uh, you know, the true algorithm is a property algorithm. And uh, there, was a, there was a scandal because if you, if you Google on the, on the Google search bar, the, the word uh, Holocaust, uh, about uh, one hour, one hour a year ago, you wouldn't find next to it uh, the, the, another word, which was hoax. And uh, the Google search engine was uh, basically pairing together the word Holocaust with hoax. And uh, the first 10 pages uh, that you would, you would have found in the, in the Google uh, search engine, uh, nine of the, the first 10 were about uh, Holocaust, but uh, uh, controlled by a uh, neo-Nazist uh, group. Uh, there was a scandal in the U.S., and now the, the algorithm seems to be fixed. I, I checked yesterday, by the way. Uh, there is no any more like this type of problem. But this, uh, this is uh, basically an important signal that we receive from these tech giants. So they don't care anymore about the content that they put on their platform. They just care about our data, because they, this is where they monetize their value. Okay. Um, 
Of course, uh, these are basically uh, borderless operations that they took place uh, cross-country, so basically the tax authority seems to, to be um, uh, bystanders uh, and passive uh, you know, uh, with respect to, to their operation. I have to say that the European Commission took a step forward in this direction, uh, and uh, with the, you remember with the recent fine uh, to Google, which was uh, costing billions of dollars, uh, but there is a, a long way to go in this direction still. So um, uh, the antitrust authorities uh, uh, didn't perform well in the last years, and usually, you know, the 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 the, the authorities uh, are a little bit always uh, lagging behind of these uh, new innovations. Um, and of course, uh, uh, other problems are basically uh, the fact that these uh, tech giants that are basically uh, holding a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, cash, they, 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 they can stifle innovation by acquiring the competitors, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, these are all, uh, all the problems that uh, uh, are basically uh, driving, driving, driving us uh, as, a, as, a, as an end user to the, to, the, to, the, to the trust issue problem with respect to this tech giant. So, what, 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 uh, what uh, uh, is important, well, here, this is a a, a bold statement I would like to read with you together. So the web that many connected two years ago uh, is not what the new users will find today. Uh, what was once a rich selection of blogs and websites has been comp uh, compressed under the powerful weight of few dominant platforms. This concentration of power creates a new set of gatekeepers, allowing a handful of platforms to control uh, which ideas and opinion are seen and, and shared. So this is the common opinion. This was a uh, a bold statement that was uh, expressed in 2018 by uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who is the inventor of the World Wide Web. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, statement from this uh, authoritative person. And uh, this gives you basically the, the tip of the, of the iceberg, which, where you, you understand that there is something underground movement that is, uh, that is uh, taking place now in order to depart from these centralized platform business models. Um, well, uh, some, some of us, some economists say, okay, we, have a, the, we are in front of the Hobson choice here, or either we, we, we let these monopolies uh, uh, to, to, to keep control of our uh, platforms, uh, of this platform, so they are becoming the status quo, or we, we, we give the control of this platform to, 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 to the government. It's basically the Chinese uh, uh, straightforward solutions to this type of problem. So, but the underground movement that is not much underground, but uh, is emerging in the last years, is, uh, is, uh, is about a third way. So how we can uh, use a new technology to depart from this centralized business model and to uh, develop um, a decentralized platform business model. How we can redesign our business model such, in, such that to, to give back uh, 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 data control to the end users and the privacy, and uh, how to re rebuild trust. Well, a technology that certainly is a good candidate is blockchain, because uh, accountability and transparency are uh, important uh, uh, building blocks of any blockchain system, and these are basically underpinning any type of trust uh, mechanism. So, um, moving from uh, a, a centralized business model, uh, uh, platform business model, to a decentralized platform business model can, can certainly bring, uh, bring certainly interesting, uh, uh, interesting benefits uh, in the sense that uh, uh, we don't need any more uh, to resort uh, on the algorithms provided by the other. So you think about the um, reputation-based systems uh, of uh, the dif this different platform, which is based on the translation-based uh, uh, feedback mechanism, which are basically algorithms that we don't really know how they work and how they are implemented by the platforms. So we can depart from this and we can uh, uh, use this technology to, to, to allocate a certain level of trust uh, to each other without uh, resorting on, uh, on third parties. Uh, of course, uh, uh, fraudulence and uh, manipulation, fraudulent activities and manipulation of data is not possible, and this is another positive uh, aspect of moving from centralized to decentralized platform business model. Um, prosumers, as I called before, are uh, able to use their trustworthiness and to uh, support their trustworthiness from, from platform to platform, starting from the identity. And the recent uh, uh, investment on, on, on micro, this recent move on, on, on Microsoft into, uh, into blockchain uh, 
uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the first seed toward this, uh, this uh, multi-platform uh, identity system or trust system. So Microsoft, uh, is, uh, Microsoft is working to build a decentralized a digital identity system on, on Bitcoin blockchain. And, um, and this will allow basically to use this Bitcoin blockchain to become uh, basically the the, the keepers of our the, get, the, the gatekeepers of our data and uh, and uh, without basically uh, giving us the data to a third party uh, now basically uh, when you subscribe to Airbnb and uh, they ask you to log in with your uh, Facebook credentials uh, there is a, a third party that take your data and uh, and uh, from Facebook and uh, give it to, to to Airbnb so they, they they want to depart from this type of uh, uh, third-party service model to, to allow basically this technology to manage this data and us at the end of the day by owning our private keys. So this is basically uh, a, 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 an interesting step that uh, hopefully will uh, will open up uh, a new a new a new way for uh, for this for these platform models, a new way of doing or generating uh, um, or generating uh, um, uh, revenue. Uh, certainly, another benefit of moving uh, uh, to the centralized business model is basically, uh, especially if you think about the, the application of smart contracts. So, if you enter into a smart contract agreement, then uh, you somehow pre-committed to well behave uh, in the in the in the event of uh, in the, in the case of uh, an unfavorable event because uh, there is a smart contract which basically uh, has these automatic enforcement rules. So change uh, completely the economic uh, uh, basically uh, principle uh, uh, upon which uh, the, most of the transactions take place and uh, where basically there is asymmetry information and there is these uh, hazards that usually you need to take into account when you do business with un uh, uh, unknown peoples. Um, and finally, which is basically uh, uh, the, the holy grail is that we can control our data. Basically, we can monetize, whether we can decide whether we want to monetize our data or not, whether we want to share and with whom the, uh, the, 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 the transactions data that we generate every day to, 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 to third parties to, 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 to generate revenue. So it's our choice. So, um, and uh, in this respect, the authorities can help uh, the new uh, move uh, the European Commission also with respect to the GDPR is something uh, somehow in this direction. And uh, at the same time, the European Commission is also investing quite heavily in uh, blockchain, uh, in the development of the blockchain ecosystem. So I, I really think that this will be the, 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 the next wave. So moving from this uh, decentralized platform business model to decentralized platform business models. What we can, what is the, uh, journey from uh, the pipeline uh, uh, business models to these uh, um, uh, decentralized business model uh, passing through the centralized business model uh, imply? Well, there would be a shift of trust. Remember, you know, we had the trust that was uh, the trust uh, on brands, on uh, solid corporations, uh, brick and mortar corporations. We trust if we see you know, uh, the building, if we see the branch in the bank, if we, if we, if we have a strong brand, and then we move to algorithm. So uh, the algorithm uh, provides the so-called synthetic trust. Uh, I will talk about the syn this synthetic trust uh, at the end of this talk. Um, and uh, and uh, certainly uh, this is a shift of power so from a hierarchical organization to to lateral network. So, uh, when I talk about lateral networks, so basically I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the new frontiers where many people are working at the moment. So shifting the boundaries of a territorial organization to non-territorial self-organized uh, business model, which is basically uh, mimicking the, basically the decentralized uh, autonomous corporations. And there is a lot of, uh, of activity in these directions. Uh, and then the shifting of control. So. Uh, uh, basically, uh, with this algorithm, we are able to lower the transaction cost uh, because the search information cost is lower because the bargaining cost through the consensus mechanism is very effective, very, very cheap, and the, through the, the smart contract, the supervision enforcement cost is lower. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting here in this uh, in this journey uh, a view of a blockchain not only as an ICT technology, but uh, I'm looking at it as also as a, a an institutional through the institutional economics lens. So as a technology that can change really the business models. Um, 
this is something already happening, it's not uh, in the future, so we have different industry verticals where we have uh, uh, new uh, solutions which are basically blockchain-based or, or, or blockchain-inspired, and this could be in payments, in storage, social network, in a platform where we have this new platform that allow the development of uh, decentralized applications and so on. So it's difficult, anyhow, to, to map uh, uh, the current landscape of the blockchain development. Or development. This is, a, this is, there, is a, there is a fear competition because we are still in the era of firm of technical, technical variations, rivalry, competition, technical uncertainty, which is fantastic, which is very fantastic because when there is competition, there is also um, uh, the certainty that there is no monopoly, monopoly rent from anyone else. So uh, it's good to have competition. And uh, uh, we are certainly not going to to see uh, the emergence of a dominant design. I, I guess we are going to see the emergence of multiple uh, uh, dominant designs, designs because uh, different blockchains, uh, if we look indeed uh, as a blockchain uh, through the lens of institutional economics, different blockchains uh, will serve a different type of uh, community goals. And the blockchain technology that uh, fit one community goals doesn't necessarily should fit the, the, other, uh, the goals of, the, of another community. And this is basically the case uh, if you look at the blockchain uh, from a public or you know, open and closed perspective. You, know? you have uh, uh, open blockchains that are basically serving the needs of uh, an open community. They allow basically from the, from the public permissionless point of view, they allow basically everyone to read, everyone to write, and everyone to commit. This is, which is basically, uh, basically based on the principle of uh, giving back back power to the people uh, um, and control of their, of their data without any, any third party. Well, we, and at, at the very end, we have the closed uh, permission uh, blockchains, which uh, basically allow the full control uh, by a subset of, uh, of PR, which is, which is good, which is fine uh, if you think about the uh, transition in the banking sector where you don't need uh, to share the ledgers to the, uh, um, to the public. Uh, uh, of course, uh, of course, is uh, is uh, is difficult, and uh, I have uh, done a, a study with uh, Claudio here uh, about the taxonomy of uh, blockchain technologies. We try to uh, use a reverse engineering approach to unbundle uh, these different components and try to uh, identify uh, hierarchically uh, the main and the sub components and the different layouts uh, for the sub components. Um, you will see soon uh, in the blockchain tree which is uh, not yet online, but will be soon, uh, is a, we ca will be a kind of a Wikipedia for, for, for the blockchain evolutions. And we are going to, 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 to monitor the evolution of the different layouts over time. So this is a, um, a work we are doing with uh, Claudio and, uh, and Florian here uh, in order to, you know, to allow the community to, 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 bring, uh, uh, to bring more knowledge into this type of, uh, um, of complex type of uh, uh, technologies. So we see here the different consensus uh, that which is split in the network topology, uh, failure tolerance, the gossiping. We, we have different type of layouts. I'm, going, I'm not going to explain, but uh, I, I please uh, ask you to, to look at this. Uh, website soon. So, uh, to conclude, uh, I would like to, to say that, okay, uh, if we have seen here that uh, uh, basically uh, the governance model of major of the, is the brown area, uh, the majority of the blockchains uh, is, uh, is open and public, uh, well, uh, uh, we observe also that there is a tension between, uh, between, uh, between, uh, between different forces in the, in, the, in the public blockchain. So the tension is between the security, scalability, and decentralization. So by keeping uh, uh, solid, fixing the security, you either choose the, between scalability and the decentralization. And uh, what we observe is that uh, the majority of uh, the uh, public blockchains have uh, basically uh, chosen uh, uh, scalability uh, with respect to the um, uh, inside of decentralizations. And you see this, uh, for example, by looking at the major uh, blockchain stack uh, on which thousands of different uh, uh, dApps are built on. So the top five money uh, ETH pool uh, secured about 80% of the transaction ledger. The 30% of the Bitcoin core code was written by a single coder. So the 30% of the Bitcoin, uh, 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 so that 50% of all comments of the uh, Bitcoin improvement proposal came from only the 0.3% of the commenters. So uh, very tiny percentage of the community. The 100 richest Bitcoin addresses keep about the 20% of the whole Bitcoin wealth. And the 20% of the entire ATR core code was written by a single coder. So 
this is this basically the way to decentralize uh, the platform business model? Is this really the way we wanted to? to is, is this really the, the goal we wanted to achieve? Uh, to give basically to shift the power to to this uh, basically uh, tech giant to uh, groups of uh, uh, very often, if not always, anonymous people that uh, um, control uh, basically uh, uh, or uh, write the write the rules uh, and update the rules of these ledgers. Well, uh, this this is really uh, this is really a problem, and uh, and uh, this is really against uh, what uh, is basically the open, transparent, and uh, free to use, uh, universally uh, accessible blockchain. Uh, so there are so desired by the masses when we, they wanted to depart from the centralized from centralized business models, and uh, and indeed uh, uh, there is a, a a rather stark choice here or either we uh, you know uh, give away our privacy to centralized but accountable uh, centralized platform business uh, model like uh, facebook uh, google and the others that may uh, use uh, uh, data surveillance for commercial purposes without our permissions or we give uh, or we try to to keep control of our trust uh, um, or uh, digital trust uh, uh, through this trust machine, which is blockchain, uh, by giving power to this uh, group of anonymous people who could uh, easily go rough. So um, I conclude here with this uh, with this uh, stark choice because I think uh, uh, we have uh, plenty of of saying today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paolo. <laughs> Questions. I had a question that was related to the, uh, in a slide 14, with the trade-off between privacy. Because at the end of the day, when you mentioned the uh, uh, properties of blockchain, you didn't mention anything about, uh, you didn't say that one of its properties, because it is not, was privacy. So how is this solved, in, even in these decentralized systems? How do you uh, ab ab I'm not avoid sure. losing them? Um. Here, basically, you were saying. So the question is about the, um, the privacy. Well, um, well, it depends. There are different, uh, as you know, different uh, blockchain layouts that uh, can uh, uh, embed a different type of uh, um, privacy uh, um, uh, mechanism to guarantee some uh, uh, anonymity. So to move from a pseudo anonymity type of blockchain and Bitcoin to more anonymous. So we have already uh, several uh, design uh, um, uh, on this respect. So uh, it is, it is, it is uh, not yet clear, although how you, uh, you balance, you find the equilibrium between having, especially for public blockchains, where basically um, I'm thinking about uh, public blockchain that serve uh, uh, community needs, uh, how, you, how you balance between the transparency, the need that you need to have, and the, and, and the, and the same time by granting some level of privacy. So the, there, is a, <clears throat> there are some studies, some research that also we are doing, uh, some of my colleagues at the UCL, exactly pointing to this, trying to solve this point, this part, uh, by basically um, uh, allowing basically an external auditor that could be um, you know, uh, a, um, you know, a law enforcement agency or or, or or another regulators to to check the transaction without violating their privacy by 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 only sharing piece of the information and uh, by only basically the, uh, uh, sharing piece of information, uh, uh, allowing basically the receiver to understand to understand that you are indeed. Uh, the um, the legitimate owner of the data, and you indeed are basically uh, the sender of the recipients of the previous transaction that you claim to have to have done. Um, but uh, the, the, the a definitive solutions, I think, to this problem is not yet there. So we request some 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 and results. If there is no other question, I had a very short one. If you can answer in one sentence. Oh, you had one, please. But I had one that is, how do, would you solve in one sentence the, conun the conundrum of centralization? <laughs> there, is, um, there is some research going on at the MIT. They, try, they, they claim to have found a, a new uh, blockchain that solved this, uh, this trilemma. Uh, I don't know, because also if you read the, the, the Bitcoin white paper, uh, Satoshi wrote uh, one CPU, one vote, uh, 
uh, one had one vote. Indeed, uh, we, 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 we saw that at the beginning was like that, but then later on was not like that. So there is generally in the blockchain, uh, uh, in the blockchain space, there is uh, very often, I, I observe, a dichotomy between uh, what, uh, what is the research, what is implemented um, or find at the research level and what is really implemented at the code base. And very often you see that there is a mismatch between the two. You, know, you don't really know who is wrong or who is right. So um, uh, if you claim at the, at the white paper level, that you have a solution, very often it's very difficult to test uh, and, uh, unless you, you don't really implement it and you, with the real data. And therefore, uh, uh, in order to answer your question, we need to arrive at that point to develop it. Happy to know. Please, the last question. Okay, so my question is for slide number 20. So yeah, I often saw this difference between the closed uh, mm -hmm. blockchain type. So you have consortium and private permissioned. But what is actually the difference between the two of them when it comes to, for example, which platform do you use or the use cases? Uh, well, well uh, um, uh, this is just a, a, an, an extract, uh, so, so to say, a, a, a cheat sheet uh, from, from this exercise, if you want. If you want to understand how you want to implement, uh, uh, which type of blockchain technology you want to implement, uh, uh, for to achieve a sp special uh, social uh, uh, intent or a, a business purpose or whatever it is, uh, you need you need to really understand what are the different building blocks, and you really need to choose between the different building blocks. So here is just a summary of uh, of the different building blocks that we picture here. So it's, it's really depend. Uh, uh, it's really a reverse engineering approach. So here you need to start from the end and then reconstruct. Uh, the different uh, layouts according to what you want to achieve. Uh, what we observe at the moment is that most of the applications are based on uh, uh, blockchain uh, software as a service or blockchain platform that are already uh, basically Predefined, uh, uh, ready to be used from the chefs, which is uh, which is which is fine at the beginning because there is no the in uh, intensive knowledge uh, and uh, accurate knowledge from the industry point of view. But uh, uh, you will see in the years to come uh, that uh, the maturity of the industry will increase with respect to this new technology, and there are also their their choice with respect to the, the different uh, components and layout will become more 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 precise, and uh, and this is basically. Uh, uh, bringing us uh, to the point, okay, if we have uh, uh, multiple design choices, uh, which is the case for, 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 for how complex is our uh, economy, then how you allow then uh, these different blockchains to talk to each other if, whenever there is a need of this. And, uh, and therefore, this is basically uh, the, new, the new step about uh, interoperability and standardization. So we are talking at the beginning, I talked at the beginning about the container and the barcode. The container barcode is, the, uh, is, is a combined technology that works for all the physical goods, independently which type of goods are you transferring from one country to another. So we need to find a smart, contact, smart uh, um, data container which work uh, uh, the same for any type of data you want to transfer from one point to the other in the world. And the blockchain is, it can be the solution, but it doesn't need, doesn't need to be the same smart data container as it was uh, the same container and the same barcode as in the physical goods. Can be, we can have different, different designs, but the important is that to, uh, to allow interoperability. Welcome everybody after the failed coffee break experience. So uh, the next presentation in this uh, session is going to be by Professor Alexander Berenstein from the University of Basel, who is going to talk about a game theoretic model of proof of stake. Uh, professor Berenstein is a professor of economic theory and also the dean of the Faculty of Business and Economics uh, at Basel. And he is also one of the founding members of the Center for Innovative Finance. Thank you very okay. much, Alexander, for joining uh, thanks, today. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I have been to many conferences in this space, but they were all kind of this, uh, you know, business talks, selling, ICOs, uh, all these things. And I'm really happy to have some serious academic uh, conference for once. Uh, but don't expect too much. Uh, what I'm going to present to you is uh, well, it's the building blocks for a game theoretic model of proof of stake. Uh, the slides are not yet on. Here they are.
Yeah, all right. Um, but before I start, I have to uh, excuse myself. In fact, I have to leave. Of, uh, you know, I can stay uh, for lunch, but then I have to leave. There's another parallel conference um, of the IMF and, and the Swiss National Bank that I have to attend. I, I, ho I was hoping I can sneak out and disappear, but it's not possible. <laughs> I have to go back. So, um, Good. Okay, let, let, let's get started. So I don't really need to uh, motivate too much. I have also to say something, so my background is clearly economics, uh, I did a lot of game theory and stuff like this, but of course, if you want to write something sensible about proof of stake, you also need to be a little bit a computer scientist. Um, probably I get something wrong, I really hope for your input, tell me if, you know, I might have some questions which I think are very hard, I don't understand, and for you it's very easy to answer, right? Or I might actually ask wrong questions and look at the wrong models, uh, just please correct me uh, in order to make progress. Um, I would be really happy if you could uh, tell me what you think about it. Uh, by the way, I have to say this is also joint work with Marina Markheim sitting there in the corner, just there and uh, supervising me. <laughs> Good. Well, I don't have to introduce this too much. I think the basic uh, ideas about proof of stake and proof of works work are there. I think the benefits of proof of work, we, we kind of know it works. Right. It has been around for 10 years, it works very well, uh, it's well tested in practice, gives you a lot of security, uh, at least if the, if the chain is sufficiently large, you know, if there's enough hashing power behind it. There are many problems, I would say, uh, you know, energy consumption is a problem, I think. Look, this is not really my opinion, don't think so, I mean, I don't care too much about the electricity use. But in terms of politics now, if I go back to my conference that I also attend, you know, during the day uh, there at the IMF, and they're really concerned about it, right? They really think this is crap. It's just crap. You know, it's just a waste. It's used by criminals. It's energy waste. And so that's their opinion. And that could be actually the, 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 the opinion that prevails in the public if, it, if, it, if you're not able to solve these problems. Another problem is actually some sort of uh, centralization, scalability, we talked a lot about it, you know, can we scale proof of work really? Um, and finally, I think price volatility. That's a big, huge issue. I haven't put it in here, because this is of course also true for proof of uh, stake models. Okay, what does, so proof of stake, low energy consumption, I would say at least it would solve that problem. But, um, and some people even say block production would be less centralized than in proof of work. I, this is not my opinion. I just report what we hear, right, if you, if you read uh, Reddit and other stuff. Uh, but I think the key issues are security here, right? We just don't know whether these things are going to provide the same security as proof of work. And that's why many are hesitant to change. Uh, and they're kind of untested in practice, even though there are many chains running on proof of stake, but they're kind of slow, small. Right? In terms of market capitalization, uh, it's a completely different animal if you, ha you, if you have 100 billion than if you have just 500 million as market capitalization. Good. Uh, okay, now, now I'm starting to, to make some statements. Please correct me, or later on. Uh, at the end of the day, if you look at a typical proof-of-stake mechanism, uh, you just have a set of validators, and that set can be either static you know, kind of predefined or just moves very slowly, or it can adjust uh, dynamically. Uh, the stake, the word stake is also obvious, right? Stake is basically you put up some collateral, right? And then you're punished. The idea would be that you are punished for bad behavior. So what else do we have? Now, if you think about typically, you know, there is in a given time interval, you know, in blockchain space, we don't really have time, but I still use this uh, notion. Um, a validator is chosen at random. Um, he's going, you know, it's basically a leader, leadership contest. You know, somebody is just chosen at random to propose a block. And then they, they also differ in various ways. You know, sometimes they just you know, attach a block and, you know, the game goes on. And sometimes there's a voting round added to it. Um, then some, some, most of them actually have block rewards or fee income, but not all of them. 
So th there, there are differences, you know, in the different uh, designs of these uh, proof of stake models. Um, well, the voting thing I said, mo many of them actually, I, I, I won't have voting today in my model, right? Some of them have this kind of uh, voting rounds, uh, which I think has the advantage, or I think people believe it gives you some finality if everybody votes on it. I have never understood it. I'm not a computer scientist. For me, as an economist, there's no finality. There's just no, zero. You can revert everything, right? But I think computer scientists have a different view of what finality is. Maybe we can discuss this later on. Good. Now, the other thing which, 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 which is probably important, and most important actually once you, you, once you address, you know, you start doing it uh, through game theory, is the consensus rules. I consider consensus rules basically some, the idea how people should behave. For example, you shouldn't add a double spend right in your block. Um, you should typically attach your block to the longest change. These, these are just consensus rules. There are many more. I'm, I'm not going to look at many. I'm, I'm basically only looking at one today, just for you know, make it life simple. But I, th I think here game three really comes into play. I mean, you can propose many consensus rules. They're completely in, you know, useless or invalid if they are not self-enforcing, right? It must be, in, in, in terms of game theory, it must be a best response to follow these rules, right? Everybody's is looking around and thinks, oh, maybe I can do this or do this, maybe, maybe I can profit by doing this or profit by doing this. Consensus rules have to be in a way that nobody can deviate profitably, right? And then this thing is self-enforcing and it's actually going to be an equilibrium, uh, a Nash equilibrium or Sopkin perfect Nash equilibrium. I'm going to work with these equilibrium concepts. Okay, now I already get to the model. So how should we, how should we address, what are the building blocks? So what, what, what should we look at? I'm going to go, I will just show you the way uh, we model it. This is the most simple model, which we, uh, one reason we did it like this, because we can solve it immediately. I, I will present you some theorems about it. But this is not the last word, and some of the assumptions are unrealistic, and the first one you see already. No, the finite number of known, no, that's fine. Finite number of known validators. There are some proof of stake models uh, in, in reality that have that, right? Some, them, some are open, right? It is free, en no, not free entry, but you can enter and exit easily. Here we assume it's just known and there are N. The second assumption is actually the one that is a little bit, uh, probably most difficult to swallow, but it really makes it very much easier to, to um, to solve it, it's this finite number of discrete time periods. So we really assume the game ends. And if you do some game theory, you know why we do it, because that's kind of simple, right? You can do, solve it by backward induction. However, by constructing this model, we have gained some ideas how we can phrase it in a, infinitely, uh, you know, in, in a model with infinitely many periods. So we kind of know how to do it. The reason why we don't want to do it you know, once you have this infinitely many periods, you have all sorts of fault theorems. Fault theorem may basically tell you mo mostly everything is in equilibrium. That makes it not really, you know, attractive. But we'll be going to, that it's going to be the next step. Okay, so also for simplification, we say there is something like the, called the epoch. And the idea would be in an epoch, you know, every player or e every validator can choose a block once in an epoch. That's why we divide it into epochs. It kind of simplifies uh, also the analysis a little bit. <clears throat> okay, the idea, okay, now the next assumption that you won't like. A validator per epoch proposes one block and only one block. <clears throat> and here it's just, a, 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 you know, the notation B and E will be a uh, block you know, player N and epoch E. That's the block of player N and epoch E. And blocks are created sequentially. Um, I think the very, very early forms of proof of stake had something like this, but nobody does it anymore. It's, it's because it, this, this is not random. You know exactly when it's your turn to, to create a block, right? So here you can see, so this is epoch E, player one, then player two, and, and so on. 
Uh, just to make this crystal clear, the theorems that I'm going to show, they also hold for random choices. They, you know, it's a, it's a kind of an easy extension, and you can show, you can basically use the same results from game theory to prove uh, existence of Nash equilibria and stuff like this. Good, then we are going to have a block reward R per block. And we are going to have a fee, but this is only kind of in the last third theorem that I'm going to show. We have a one-time fee, just a one-time fee. And it's going to create a lot of problems for the equilibrium. So for most of the talk, it's the fee. there's no fee, it's just a reward. Oh, okay, now are the rooms. So what we need to do, you know, in, to, in, in order to phrase it in terms of game theory, we have to, you know, define the actions. What, what, what can people to do, right? Uh, and basically what we say, they're going, what they can do is uh, they create these blocks, right? That's it. And the choice they have is where do they want to attach them? Right? Because in some sense, I want to show under which conditions, you know, kind of the, uh, uh, the, an unforked chain is going to be a Nash equilibrium. That's, the, that's going to be the key question. Right? And so we, but we allow these guys to fork. Right? Um, so the way we build it up, and you see a chain is kind of growing. You, know, you have more and more choices over time because if you can attach to any block, the more blocks are there, the more, the more choices you have. So there is this genesis block, which is B0, that's just given. We just assume it's given, but it, it doesn't really matter. We could also assume the first guy puts up the, the genesis block. It doesn't matter. But we assume it's given. And then what you see next is the, uh, the player or validator 1 can choose this block 1-1. One, one. So 1, again, is for player validator 1, epoch 1. And he can only attach it to the genesis block, because there's only one block. Right now, the, the other one can attach it to. This is now player two. Now he has two choices. He can attach it to the genesis block or the previous block, and you can see how this goes on. Okay, that's that's the thing. Okay, now consensus rule. That's very important, and somehow also a bit restrictive. I assume for now, you know. They only include a legitimate transaction. Or you could assume, okay, I, I, I make the game a little bit more complicated. Everybody actually controls it. And if somebody adds an invalid block, right, uh, he's basically just ignored. Nobody attaches to it. And then he basically uh, loses the block reward. But you can actually model this in a game theoretic way. I haven't done it. So that's why I just assume it. <clears throat> okay, but the other consensus rule is attach block to longest chain that includes only a legitimate transaction. That's a consensus rule. Right? That's what we want. We don't want to ha have this kind of crazy forked you know, chains that go in all directions. That's completely useless. Right? But we need to, this is a consensus rule, but we need to, this has to be self-enforcing somehow. Right? Uh, in proof of work, we know exactly why they, why they do it. You know, what's the, you know, what's the game theory behind it, why they do it. So now we want to know for proof of stake the same, basically get an answer for it. Simplification, again, there is no punishment for now <clears throat> for not following the consensus rule. The only, thing, the only punishment is, would be that you lose your block reward, right, if you're not on the longest chain. I will show you how the payoffs are constructed in this game. Okay. Oh, here I. Um, okay. I, I said this also. Uh, all transactions are legitimate, but also the reward cannot manipulate it. You know, you could also, because if you construct a block, you can also basically write into the block, right? Manipulate the software and say, well, I don't get R. I get ten times R. Right. So we don't allow this. Good. This is the only. That's the only rule for now that we are going to look at. Uh, you know, the rule attached to the longest chain. Are these rules self-enforcing? That's the key question. Um, now, I don't know how many game theories are here that game. Actually, the, the reason why we constructed it in this way, we basically trans translated it to sta a standard game, right? It's a game, with sequential, it's a sequential game with perfect information. 
that we know exactly the results that we get out of it, the theorems that we get out of it, right? So that was a little bit the goal also of the abstraction, the simplification of the game. So now I'm going to present you the results. Uh, and then we can think about you know, making it more realistic in, in several dimensions. <coughs> that thing can be solved for backward induction. Um, good, okay, let's know. Let's go on and, and put it even more in a game theoretic uh, context. <clears throat> So in game theory, people have strategies, right? And the Nash equilibrium, for example, is just a, you know, a strategy profile, a, you know, a strategy for every player, uh, such that no player can deviate and benefit by doing something different. So we need to know exactly what, what strategies these guys are available. It's a little bit complicated because it's, the, the, you know, basically because of the block structure. Good. This is just what you see here. This is the set of strategy of player N. Um, I haven't shown you the set, it's actually pretty, it's really, it's big. That thing is, goes very fast, very big, so that's why I don't write on, down anything. Uh, the number of strategies here, uh, you can calculate it, here is the num total number of players, here is the, you know, it kind of, uh, E will be the epoch and N is, is the, uh, this is player N. i give you just an example. Uh, consider a three times three proof of stake game. So three means three epochs, three players. I can do it for any epochs and any players, right? I mean, it's just a, just use the formula. But you can easily understand how, how the number of uh, strategies, you know, how kind of it quickly explodes, right? In the, so this is player one, first epoch. He can only attach to the, to the um, Genesis block. Now here is in the second epoch. Now there are kind of four blocks set already. Uh, in, the, in the second, uh, first epoch, second, third, there are all seven blocks. That's why it multiplies, right? That gives you the number of strategies. He has 28 strategies. Uh, for player two, you know, it's just always you add one because he's just coming after one and so on. But you see how quickly it explodes? Um, Okay. Now, one thing that I have to say before I end, because then we have the description of a game. You know, a description of the game is just the number of players, you know, what actions they have available or what strategies they have available, and at the end of the day, the rewards, the payoffs. For the payoffs, I make a little simplifying assumption as well here. First of all, there's this block reward R. If, so we, go, we let them play the game, and then we're going to count and see how many of these rewards are on the longest chain, because only the longest chain is going to get a payout. Right? Forks that are short or something have no payout. So if the block reward R, big zero, if block is included in the longest chain, else you get nothing, it turns out that you can have actually draws. You can, have, you can construct um, situations where you have two chains that are of equal length. So we had to make a decision. How do we pay out uh, the rewards? And we just assume, assumed, well, we, we just have some weights. You know, for this, suppose there are like three chains that emerge from that game that have equal lengths. You can think that would be one third, one third, one third. That's how we calculate the, the rewards. And the idea here is a little bit, of course, we know in reality, there's no end point, right? In reality, we, we believe, of course, that game goes forever. But then sometimes you have chains of equal length, and somehow they, these guys are uncertain which one is going to survive, and then impute, say, a probability of 1.5 to this chain or 1.5 to this chain. That's how you, they calculate their payoffs. That's kind of an approximation to this idea. Anyhow, I think I have everything. Oh, yeah, I have everything. I can present the results. So how do I do it in terms of time here? 12. Okay, that's good. Okay, now I, I define S star. This is a strategy profile. It's a strategy for every player. Uh, and in this strategy profile, they follow the consensus rule. They always attach to the longest one. That's their strategy. My strategy, I always attach to the longest one, right? <clears throat> now I can easily calculate the payoff 
of following this strategy. This is just a number of epochs times the reward. OK, now when I want to know whether this is going to be an equilibrium, I have to kind of figure out, do they have a profitable deviation? Do they, you know, can they kind of do something else which gives them a higher payoff? If my answer is no, it basically tells me well, that thing is an equilibrium object, right? It's kind of the longest chain. OK, let's go through the results. So in this basic proof of stake game, uh, the strategy profile S star is a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. So a strategy profile where everybody follows this consensus rule is an equilibrium. It, does, it means nobody has a profitable deviation. Under, of course, under all these simplifying assumptions that I have done, which I am gladly going to relax later on. But for now, that's what they are. OK, now, by the way, I have no, you know, when I do this kind of work, I have no opinion. I don't care. It's not like Bitcoin maximalist versus whatever, and then you beat each other. I, don't, I simply don't care. You know, if, if my results are proof of stake, it's the best, I'm fine with it. If it says it doesn't work, I'm fine with it. So don't, you know, don't blame me now. I know if there are some Bitcoin maximalists here, they will hate me for this result, <laughs> right? But then I show you the next result. And the third, then we'll, they will love me again. So, no, I don't show you. The, the proof is actually really simple. Um, okay, assume strategy profile S star. Then what, what you can show, it's a Nash equilibrium. But every player is indifferent between forking and not forking. It cannot, it just doesn't give him a, you know, a benefit. But it gets the same payoff. I show you an example. And you can just construct these things of, you can just construct, and then you see this. So here, OK, let, let me look at this quickly. This is the unforked chain here. That's a Nash equilibrium. We just showed that. The, the way you read it, this is the Genesis block, the first block, for next one, next one. These are the three epochs. This is just a three by, by three game. Three epochs, three players. Um, so I just showed this is a Nash equilibrium, right? Nobody has a profitable deviation can do strictly better off nobody however you can easily show that you know and this is just an example for example this player one he forks here right basically this guy has bad luck because this guy forks and because everybody else follows this longest chain rule you know the thing goes goes like this and if you look at the payoff of the guy of player one he has the same payoff you know, under this chain as under this chain. That's what I mean. He forked, and he gets the same payoff. It doesn't benefit, but he gets the same payoff. And you can construct many such deviations, um, and you can show they get the same payoff. That might be actually a reason why, you know, why there is, it's proof of stake, why people talk about slashing and stuff like this, you know. Because you, you want correct certain behavior. I haven't talked about it yet. Good. So I think uh, what theor theorem says, two says, is, is basically that this, and even though it's, a, it's an equilibrium, it's kind of fragile, very fragile, right? Uh, they can, very little things can happen, and then they suddenly are really better off by, by you know, moving to another, by forking. For example, I will show an example next, but just adding a one-time fee is going to destroy, destroy the, the Nash equilibrium. And here, in fact, that should come here. You see this is the same, basically the same, uh, it's the same picture. The only thing that we did here is to add this one-time fee. And now you immediately see that this guy, so player one, is not indifferent between forking and not forking. He's strictly better off. Right? He has a strict incentive to move away and try to get that fee. So this guy gets the fee here, but then the other guy knows, well, there is this fee available from these transactions, and he just forks it so that he gets the fee. So fees are going to make it very fragile, that, that system. Right? So this is one result, and again, this is just to build it up slowly. You know, then you can start thinking about, you know, how should we 
introduce, you know, say punishment, slashing, other stuff into the model um, to, to prevent this fr uh, fragility. Good. Okay, now here another, um, as I already said that basically this, the M, this is N times E proof of stake, M, so number of players and number of epochs. It's a game, has, it's a fin you know, finance sequential game with perfect information. Uh, we know, actually, there's a Sermello, right? A guy from the 19th century basically showed that this has a, I, am I right? He's a game theorist. I think it's true, right? It was Sermello. He said, these games, if nobody is indifferent between any two moves, the equilibrium is unique. But I just showed you, these guys are not indifferent. So you can have multiplicity here easily. And that's the last theorem that I'm going to show. And then I, I'm just showing you the extensions. And now you probably understand why Bitcoin maximalists are going to love me again. Right? Because I say, well, the longest chain is not the only equilibrium. There are many others, right? If you do proof of stake, and that's, you don't want that. I think the goal of any blockchain is to have something that is you know, uninterrupted, except for good reasons. Okay, so this equilibrium S star is not unique, and I, this is also just shown by, by an example here. I don't know, you can read it, or I can try to explain it. Again, this, this is the longest chain, that's a Nash equilibrium, and we basically show that, that that thing here is also an Nash equilibrium. That's also a stable situation, right? Um, that's the um, that's that's the way it is. Okay. So key takeaway. So we are, as you can see, we are really just starting to to analyze it. But I think what we have done, we have I think we have to translated in, into proper game theory, and now we see what we can do. Uh, and I think that's something that, I know, maybe some computer scientists correct me, but I think that hasn't been done yet in this way. Um, so the late, longest chain rule is a Nash, Nash equilibrium. However, the equilibrium is fragile. Small payoff changes will break it. So you need to add stuff, you know, that we see in reality, like slashing and stuff like this. Um, the mechanism needs to be amended to make it more robust. Okay, extensions many, and I hope you will come to me in the break and tell me what I should do to make it better. Um, we had a version, constructed a version, it's still finite, but the validators are basically, at any point of time, they're always chosen at random. And that's the other thing. I don't, as game theory, I, luckily, I don't have to care about the randomness. I just assume it. I think, but this, I think, seems to be a big deal in computer science. You know, how do we get a through randomness, right, in, 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 this, uh, in this blockchain. Uh, I just assume it. If you have pure, as a, through randomness, uh, you, can you can easily solve it. Actually, all the results that I showed you go through. Theorem one, two, and three. You can start voting on blocks, doing like a second round. Somebody is leadership election, somebody is chosen to propose a block, and then everybody else votes on it. It's just, you know, it just makes it compli more complicated in terms of strategy space and so on, but you can do it. Fees on top of block rewards, uh, having some, some just random fees, right? Uh, and then see, you know, how do you need, because then we clearly need some punishment at that stage, because you, otherwise we know we won't get a, a longest chain. Uh, then we have to think about, you know, how, how should be these punishments designed, etc. And that is probably the most important thing, the infinitely many rounds instead of a finite game. It's pretty complicated. No, it's, it might not even be complicated, but the problem, you, you immediately run into folk theorem stuff, you know, where everything is in equilibrium. Uh, I think we, in, typically in game theory, you have this problem, um, and I think here we will see it again. Then I think entry and exit, you know, this is, so the, the way I modeled it is almost like a permission system. Right, you have a fixed number of validators, somebody controls it. Uh, one big advantage of proof of uh, work is exactly this openness, the permissionless aspect of it. Maybe it's possible to, to model these two exit and entry of validators, delegated proof of stake, so-called checkpoints, maybe somebody can come up and explain it to me what it is. I read it from time to time, but I never, it seems to be even in Bitcoin had some checkpoints. I didn't get it. 
Maybe somebody comes to me after the talk and explains this thing to me. Slashing seems to me clear from game theory that it's just punishment, but it's actually pretty tricky. In game theory, one of the key issues is you know, the act of punishment itself must be also self-enforcing, right? Because quite often, if you do punishment, you also you, you have a cost of doing so. And so it's actually very hard to get people to punish other people if they have a, some cost themselves of, of doing this punishment. So that make, makes actually that, that thing much less uh, trivial than you think. It's not just like, okay, if you do this, then I chop your head off, right? If we could have this kind of punishment, we could implement everything. You just have somebody, you know, sleeps, forgets to produce a block, chop his head off. If somebody put a double spend, you know, head off, you know, whatever, then of course it would be easy, right? But again, you see the head off thing, it has this aspect of centralization again. So you would, you, in blockchain space, you would like to have, you know, this chopping off of head kind of in a decentralized way. Nobody decides on it. It's just like, the folks out there chopping these heads off. And then they also get their heads off chopped if they don't do the chopping themselves. You know, you have to punish the punisher if he doesn't punish and stuff like this. It's, it's really getting a little bit complicated here at that space. But it's feasible. I mean, game theory, we have these kind of models. Then security analysis, I haven't done so. Double spend, long range attacks, nothing is safe, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and now I think I'm done, done, done. This is our book. It's unfortunate in German. Good. Thank you okay, very much, you. Alexander, for the very interesting presentation. <laughs> Are there questions? Please. Uh, in the situation with the fork. Yes. The thing is, you know, the way you look at it in game theory, it, you, you basically just look at unilateral deviation, assuming that everybody else follows right, the equilibrium what strategy. What if you grow? Huh? If, if there's a tie between the longest chains, uh, if there's a tie between the longest chains, what, 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 what rule does, va does validator 2 follow to decide which one to build on? If you specified that rule, then it could easily be The rule, rule, okay. The way... Um, the way you show, so basically, okay, in, in, game, in game theory, basically say we only check for a unilateral deviation. So you could also consider yes, this to yes. be so almost an accident. One is, is deviating, but then what does, what does two do? Huh? What, what, what is the, um, so there's ambiguity here as to what the longest chain is. No, no, here is no, chains. no, I don't think so. If I counted it correctly, the longest chain is, is the genesis, next, 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 then it goes to the right, and you have two blocks, it's more than one. It's clearly this is the longest chain. Right, but for, for two building, they huh? had a choice. Two? The, the validator three. Yes. When they built, they were two longest chains. Oh, the validator, by the way, he's indifferent of attaching to the left or to the right. Well, because he's indifferent, we just say he goes to the right. But he, but, 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 but he had a choice. And he had a choice. Two because two might not, if two did, did this forking, Huh? then they, they, they now might not get the reward because three might not build on them. The validator three, he gets two. Validator two, he gets two. And validator one gets only one. So the validator that, is indifferent right. whether he but goes to three, the left or to the right. He gets the same two. The left chain, In, then it would have been two who, who, who did the fork that lost out. I, I, now I didn't understand. If, if three acoustic. built on one, the other longest chain, uh -huh. then validator two, the, the person who did the forking, lost out. Yes, but you know, in game theory, we, do, we just don't have these things. I think in reality, it would be probably what you say. You say, so, so this yeah, guy three. forked. I'm, I'm not going to. So you have to specify the rules for three, right? What does, what, what, what does, a, what does a validator who sees two longest chains do? I, I, I specified the rule that the consensus rule is to attach to the longest chain, but I look whether this is an equilibrium. And well, in yes, fact, I if, allow them to attach everywhere. Chains, what do we do to follow the consensus? Excuse me? If there are two longest chains, what do we do to follow the consensus? 
Well, if I see, if I'm in three's position, I see two long chains. Yes. Then uh, you could specify uh, the, the, an the extra rule. rule. Uh, so the, 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 the payoff rule that I defined, if two chains are of equal length, is to say they, they just split the, right, the reward. That's the payoff rule, but what does three do? What is the rule that three is following that, that means they build on two and not one? He's following the longest chain rule. It's, it's just in this case, it's indifferent. He could go yes. to the left or he could go to the right. But the point is, is that with any, any almost sensible rule, two does not uh, necessarily get a bigger payoff by forking because uh. they risk three building on the other longest chain. Yes. I, look, these are very simple uh, structures. And, and we can. You, you could change the consensus rule here and say... Um, maybe add some whistle and blow so that you get kind of this kind of behavior that it's punished. In this kind of rules that I have, this, this behavior is just not punished and they're indifferent and he says, well, why should I could go left, could go right, now he goes right, and then I establish that everybody plays best response. Nobody can, you know, okay, how can you show that this is a, actually a Nash equilibrium? It, it, because you can show nobody can deviate and make something different and gain. That's sufficient for Nash, right? That's mm -hmm. just sufficient for Nash. Of course, you, you, there are many stupid Nash equilibrium. We're dealing in game theory with it. We're dealing really, I mean, sometimes people you say, it's a Nash equilibrium, but everybody gets you know, collectively punished by this, playing this. The prison's dilemma is an example. Yeah, excuse me? Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. But this is all about extensions. You know, like, okay, yeah. maybe this is a bad rule, maybe we should modify it, but that's exactly the process to progress, right? <clears throat> I think that for the sake of time, we can continue this discussion in the lunch break. Is there any other question? I had one, actually, that was related to one very important aspect that, uh, that is present in all uh, blockchain-based systems, which is the imbalance in power of all the players, in the sense of, no. heterogeneity in who is going to uh, mint the next block in the, in the context of a uh, proof of stake. Can you say something about it? You, <clears throat> so, okay, what I didn't do, of course, here, here when, we, when we did these extensions, we just, just assume everybody has, because if you have three players, in every round, every player has a chance this of one thing. third. Mm -hmm. And then we show that all these results can go through. And I think there will be no difficulty to assume, okay, player one has 50%, the other guy has 20, the third has 30. That, I th think it wouldn't change. Well, well the 51% mm. thing, we have to get, <laughs> take care there, yeah. right? Okay, we have to be sufficiently below to see this. Mm -hmm. um, but in, I think in terms of game theory, I don't think that, you know, at least it's not, it's not too unbalanced that somebody really can dictate yeah. where it goes. I think it, it should, go, should work. Okay, you also mean that the theorems should not be distorted by this uh, no. heterogeneity? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Existence of a uh, Nash equilibrium, you know, that at least that the longest chain is a Nash equilibrium, that certainly doesn't change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If there are no more questions, then thank you very much, Alexander, for your okay. very interesting presentation. The next presenter is Professor Rolf Weber from the University of Zurich. Uh, Rolf is a professor at the law faculty in, university, in our university. He is also a member of the steering committee of our blockchain center. And he's an, exp an expert who has been consulted multiple times by the federal government on regulatory issues of blockchain-based systems. And this is what he's going to talk about today. Thank you very much, Rolf, for attending, given your tight schedule. Does this function? No. Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind um, introduction. I would like to ask a question at, at the beginning, somewhat to the floor. I could figure out that there are at least uh, two legal experts uh, in this uh, room, but just uh, to see how many of you do have a legal uh, background, I would like uh, to uh, invite uh, them to raise the hand. 
well, I mean, it's much uh, uh, more than a tool, so um, I need to be uh, more uh, sophisticated uh, than I uh, thought, in fact. Well, you see the first slide, and uh, this, again, looks a little bit unconventional or unusual, because I start with the future. And the first message which I would like uh, to convey as of today, we may say, that Switzerland is not going to implement the blockchain law. This is a relatively important message because many other countries have done so or are in the process of doing so. Only about 10 days ago, Liechtenstein, our smaller neighboring country, has uh, presented a draft for a blockchain um, law with uh, comments and explanations amounting to about 350 uh, pages. Frankly speaking, uh, I know the basics but have not yet gone through uh, all the pages. Many other countries uh, are also in the process of preparing a blockchain law. Um, this will um, not be the approach of Switzerland. In fact, the Federal Council Schneider Amann and Mauro already more than a year ago announced that Switzerland uh, would on one hand like to implement a liberal regulatory regime, but on the other hand amend those existing legal provisions which need to be adapted in order to, be, uh, to comply with uh, the technical and economic requirements of uh, blockchain. And on March 22nd, i.e. some seven weeks ago, the Federal Council has in fact presented a uh, bill with uh, many uh, proposals how the Swiss legal system should be uh, amended, uh, changed, uh, adapted, uh, etc. If you are interested, you still do have the time to hand in your personal comments to this draft bill. Uh, the delay lasts until end of June, if I'm not uh, mistaken, at least second half of uh, June. And uh, there are many points which uh, can be raised, notwithstanding the fact that, uh, at least in my uh, general uh, perception, I would say the proposals uh, are not uh, too bad and we would have to work more on details than on uh, principles. The Federal Council pro mainly proposes three groups of changes. And you can see these three groups as well on this slide. The first and probably the most uh, important part concerns the rules for transfers of crypto um, assets. By the way, I should also say that uh, the proposal of the Federal Council avoids to use the word uh, token. I'm not uh, refraining from uh, doing so, but if you go through the pages, you won't find uh, the word uh, token. So we are uh, looking at the question how crypto assets can be tr uh, transferred. And this is a particular problem on the Swiss uh, civil law, and my first uh, comments really relate uh, to Swiss uh, civil law, because in uh, principle, if we do not have a physical good, a transfer of an asset has been done by way of an assignment. And Swiss law requires written form in order to make an assignment valid. This provision has been introduced uh, in the light of consumer protection considerations. Uh, it should be clear if somebody is doing something, transferring an asset, and uh, in order to make consumers aware of their acts, the written form is required. Very obviously, on distributed ledger technology, written form does not really make sense, and uh, digital signatures known in Switzerland and in other European uh, countries are by far too complicated to be um, applied. That's one uh, problem. On the other hand, we do, of course, have legal provisions governing securities. And here it can be said that apart uh, from uh, the certificated securities, uh, some other very traditional 
paper form uh, securities. We know the uncertificated securities in uh, Switzerland for about 10 years. And insofar, insofar Switzerland um, has been uh, quite well advanced in the legal development, uncertificated uh, secu securities are not known to all uh, legal orders uh, of countries surrounding um, Switzerland. So, in uh, uh, other words, in principle at least, uh, we could have uh, the idea in Switzerland to apply the regime governing the uncertificated uh, uh, securities being defined as rights which based on a common legal bases are issued or established in large numbers and are generically identical. We do have provisions in our very old code of obligations, that's basically a contract and company law, and we do uh, also have a specific uh, law governing the uncertificated uh, uh, securities in German language, the so-called Buch Effektengesetz. But we do have a major problem. Uh, this law is based on the uh, assumption that uh, somebody uh, is r responsible for uh, having the register in a centralized way, and somehow this term of centralization, of course, think contradicts blockchain. And for that reason, the Federal Council has now decided that uh, apart from the uh, certificated securities and the uncertificated securities, we should have a third form of allowing a transfer of assets, or in this particular um, case of uh, crypto assets. And I'm coming now, unfortunately, into the legalistics. The Federal Council has been insofar consequent as it is said that this new form should be also inserted into the um, code of uh, obligations. And since the uncertificated securities uh, do uh, have the uh, provision with the number uh, Article 973C, the new provisions will have the numbers 973D, E, F, G. So we will have, uh, if this project realizes, in uh, principle, uh, four new uh, provisions. And I'm not going now into uh, the details because I've also prepared a couple of um, other slide, slides, but in general, it uh, can be said that the new law, as proposed by the Federal Council, will contain regulations on the register, which has uh, to be put in uh, place and which uh, would uh, serve the registration of the digital uh, values or of the uh, crypto uh, assets. So crypto assets would legally only be uh, valid if their existence uh, is uh, proven by entry into this uh, digital um, register. And this register, of course, has to comply with a couple of uh, conditions, such as uh, transparency of the allocation to a specific address, of course, not to a specific um, uh, person, then data security um, requirements, uh, compliance with the no change requirement, uh, very obviously the provider of the register should not be in a position uh, to uh, change certain economic conditions of uh, these uh, tokens, uh, etc. But from a functional uh, approach, it is foreseen that these uh, um, new provisions governing the registration and transfer of additional values of uh, uh, crypto assets would equal to the uh, existing uncertificated um, securities. 
This also means that we do have a couple of um, additional uh, provisions uh, which uh, I cannot discuss uh, in detail. For example, um, it uh, would be possible, according to the new law, to use crypto assets or uh, tokens um, as a pledge or as a fiduciary security. That's somehow legally a further um, complication. I would not only be able to sell my crypto asset, but I would um, also be uh, able perhaps to take a loan from a financial intermediary and then I pledge my crypto asset um, uh, to the bank or I give it as a uh, fiduciary uh, security. As a consequence, very obviously, the register uh, have, has to um, reflect the respective um, uh, fact. Uh, in particular, since contrary to uh, traditional law, possession of a digital asset is not possible as possession of a physical good. Um, would be uh, uh, possible. Then there is also a question of priority rules. What happens if we do have contradictory transactions such as, as a transfer uh, and a pledge, etc.? Uh, we will have a liability rule. And uh, finally, and that's probably the most contested uh, provision, the Federal Council is assuming that it would be necessary to have a rule which uh, allows uh, the uh, controller of the address giving access uh, to the crypto asset to declare uh, certain transactions null and void. I again um, use now the German uh, word in order to be very clear. German word is kraftlos. Erklärung. What does this mean if I lose a share uh, of Nestle, which I uh, do have uh, back uh, home under the mattress? I could go to the judge and could ask him to declare my uh, share null and my lost share null and void. And if I'm successful after lengthy proceedings, I could go to Nestle and could ask Nestle to issue a um, new share. I mean very old-fashioned, of course, because uh, I'm aware of the fact that uh, most uh, companies, in, companies in Switzerland uh, do, in fact, uh, not anymore uh, um, issue uh, certificated uh, securities. And the same um, uh, should be uh, possible also now with crypto assets. The problem, in my opinion, and I'm not a technician, how is it uh, possible somehow to shut down a token from uh, the blockchain, so it's maybe only a pr provision which uh, could be applied in future uh, if the providers of the register uh, would implement the respective uh, technical measures. This is the first and the most important part. I'm coming to the second part, uh, which I uh, have called here rules on separation. That's economically also a relatively uh, important aspect. If uh, the provider of the um, uh, register or of a platform is going uh, bankrupt. How can you take out your non-physical crypto assets out of the bankruptcy estate? In principle, according to existing law, um, it's not uh, possible or uh, only uh, possible um, if uh, a digital asset has been very clearly segregated. So the Federal Council is proposing new um, uh, rules which are partly contested because uh, segregation requirements are not very clear. But at least in principle, it should be possible in the future uh, to take out of the bankruptcy estate a digital good as today I could take out, for example, my watch which falls into the bankruptcy estate um, of my friend as soon as I can prove that it would be my watch. In addition, and this goes now even further than the blockchain uh, discussion, Federal Council is also proposing that it should be possible to take out data from bankruptcy estate. And uh, finally, as I've mentioned, there are further adjustments 
um, in the uh, anti-money laundering and uh, fintech area. In uh, particular, the Federal Council is uh, proposing that uh, provisions uh, implementing a new um, form of uh, trading platforms should be uh, introduced. The name is a digital ledger trading system. As a lawyer, I would say the big problem with this uh, new form and license consists in the fact that the Federal Council deviates uh, from the principle of technological neutrality. All of a sudden, a trading system is somehow designed according to technology and not anymore in a neutral way, um, as in the past. Um, the second uh, problem with the new provisions consists in the fact that uh, the requirements are quite high, so it would, of course, not be too difficult for uh, SIX to fulfill uh, the respective requirements and then to implement the DLT trading uh, system. However, uh, it would be rather cumbersome for small uh, startups. Nevertheless, I realize that something um, has to be made, and personally, I would not really um, object uh, to this uh, uh, new license uh, category. My uh, main concern is really how practically it uh, can be applied. Um, so this is uh, the future, and after having uh, talked about uh, the future, I will be much uh, shorter with my um, comments to the uh, present and maybe partly to the past. Obviously, I do have to say something about the uh, ICI, ICO uh, guidelines, which have been released by uh, FINMA in February 2018. Guidelines are not laws. I mean, this is maybe a little bit short and partly exaggerated statement uh, of a lawyer, but at least uh, if you look at traditional uh, categories, it is obvious that uh, provision containing the guideline of FINMA does not really have the legal quality of an actual law. Obviously, the respective uh, provisions of the guideline, uh, guidelines are um, applied. Uh, they have never been contested so far. In principle, there is no um, court decision against these uh, guidelines. In other words, we have to assume, at least as a practicing attorney, I have to assume that these uh, guidelines do almost have the quality of law, notwithstanding the fact that formally the guidelines are uh, not laws. And uh, the guidelines which uh, followed a guidance that's not the same, which follow the guidance of September 2017, distinguish between three different categories um, of uh, tokens. We do have the payment uh, uh, tokens. Uh, payment tokens, uh, obviously, as uh, it can be altered from uh, the term, uh, are uh, issued in order the uh, payment uh, means, so alternative currencies. Then uh, we do have the utility tokens, uh, being tokens which are intended to provide access digitally to an application or service by means of a blockchain-based infrastructure. Um, and uh, finally, we do have the uh, asset uh, tokens, and asset tokens represent assets such as a debt or a equity claim on the uh, issuer and asset uh, tokens, at least in traditional categories, are very similar to the securities, and consequently, asset tokens are in uh, principle regulated. The guidelines also um, say um, very clearly that uh, the know your customer uh, principles, as well as the provisions of the anti-money laundering laws um, have uh, to be observed. So there is uh, no way 
uh, to come around the respective uh, provisions. This also corresponds to the political uh, statement of the Federal Council that Switzerland should have a liberal regime. However, that uh, Switzerland should not again become the behavior, uh, uh, um, uh, not uh, um, again uh, uh, come somehow a, a place uh, in which uh, dirty money can be uh, deposited. Why uh, is this uh, classification uh, important? And I should perhaps add a term which was once uh, used by the uh, chairman of uh, FINMA, the Swiss Supervisory Authority. He said, uh, if something looks like a duck, then we treat it as a duck, notwithstanding how it is called. In um, other words, FINMA is approaching a functional, is applying a functional approach, and uh, if uh, something looks like a payment token, it is treated legally as a uh, payment uh, token. Now, the existing laws um, obviously do not uh, comply to the, uh, or are not fully in line. Uh, with uh, the categories of the um, ICO uh, guidelines. Uh, in other words, if uh, it is established which uh, kind of uh, ICO is issued in uh, practice, it uh, can be assessed which uh, laws would be applied. As I said uh, before, uh, the KYC AML uh, provisions uh, principally always apply except if, in case of a utility token, no relation to any kind uh, of financial means is given, if only a pure uh, service, for example, download of software, uh, is uh, concerned, but otherwise AML, uh, KYC have to be observed. Securities laws, definitely in case of uh, asset uh, tokens, with the consequence of the prospectus uh, obligation requirements. Utility, to the utility tokens, depending um, on the way how the utility tokens uh, are designed. In case uh, of my last example, namely download of software, it could be argued that financial means are not involved. Consequently, no application of uh, securities law. However, um, as soon as, for example, also financial dividends are promised, we move uh, into um, the uh, category uh, of financial market laws. Banking law, in principle, in the field of ICOs, usually not applicable. That's um, uh, the good uh, news, at least, um, as long as the issuer of the tokens is not um, holding tokens uh, on behalf um, of the owners of the token for a longer uh, time period. By the way, and I just mentioned this, if anybody of you should come from um, the United uh, States, in contrast uh, to um, uh, US perception, uh, tokens are also not considered to be uh, commodities. Collective investment scheme uh, laws in Europe and in Switzerland, very similar. It, uh, these laws um, could uh, be applicable uh, in case uh, that uh, ICOs are managed by uh, third parties. I'm uh, now very brief because I do not want to tell you what you can very um, easily um, read. The ICO guidelines uh, do have an annex, and uh, the um, Annex or the appendix is called Minimum Information Requirements for ICO Inquiries. In other words, if somebody is interested uh, to do uh, an ICO, it's very advisable to approach the FINMA or the particular FinTech desk of FINMA asking whether the tokens would eventually be asset tokens or payment tokens or whatever. And uh, in order to get a clearance letter or a comfort letter, FINMA um, requires that uh, the requesting uh, company is basically filling out a questionnaire, this uh, appendix, and is also describing the project 
in uh, detail. I'm, uh, as I said, not going uh, through all uh, the four main categories and the subcategories, but I think FINMA has somehow did, uh, done a quite a helpful job in listing the specific uh, questions. And if you want to go on the website of FINMA and have a look at the ICO guidelines, you see, um, for example, that uh, FINMA is asking eight specific questions to token issue characteristics and five uh, specific questions to transfer and uh, secondary um, market. This brings me uh, to the second uh, last uh, topic of my um, presentation, which is somehow partly outside of the scope of blockchain, and therefore I can be very um, brief uh, in order to meet uh, the uh, allocate, allocated time slot. FinTech is not a blockchain. It should be said very clearly, notwithstanding the fact that uh, the uh, amendments proposed uh, by the uh, uh, Federal Council to the different Swiss uh, laws mainly talk about financial matters, but blockchain to a certain extent is much pro the supply chain, etc. And on the other hand, we do have fintech business models not being based um, on uh, uh, blockchain. I just uh, would like to um, very uh, quickly mention the three uh, main pillars which um, apply uh, in uh, uh, Switzerland according to the newest uh, revisions of um, banking uh, law. The first revision was a change in the banking uh, ordinance having been impl implemented as of 1st of August. 2017, so almost uh, um, two uh, years uh, old. Uh, fintech enterprises are entitled to hold funds in a settlement account now for 60 days, not only for seven days, and as, in, as it was the case um, in um, the past. And this gives, of course, more flexibility, for example, to crowdfunding uh, uh, platforms. Then uh, we have uh, the innovation sandbox, also in place since 1st of August 2017. A fintech startup is entitled to hold public deposits of up to 1 million uh, Swiss francs. Uh, otherwise, uh, if somebody is holding deposits, this enterprise will be subject uh, to the banking license, and banking license is, of course, a very, very cumbersome exercise. So if a startup uh, company only holds um, values up to one uh, million, it would, be it would not be subject to the uh, respective banking uh, um, license. And uh, the startup would also not have to comply with many uh, other uh, provisions. Uh, for example, no depositor insurance regime must be implemented, which is a cost factor um, for uh, banks. Uh, but uh, the investor must be informed about potential risks when giving fiat money uh, to uh, such kind of startup fintech. And then we have the license light. The license light is in place since 1st uh, of January 2019, in other words, for about four and a half uh, months now. And the license light is a type of license for those fintechs which hold deposits between 1 million and 100 million. And as the word says, license light means that a license is needed. However, the requirements are not uh, as strict as in case of a banking license. I'm not going uh, into the details now. As I said, this has nothing to do directly um, with uh, a blockchain. I just wanted somehow to complete the picture. And this brings me now to my um, last topic for the remaining whatever five um, to uh, seven uh, minutes, namely um, smart contracts. Uh, smart uh, uh, contracts uh, are uh, newly discussed 
discussed issue um, in uh, legal doctrine. I think the oldest uh, really legalistic uh, article is less than two um, years old. I guess I do not have um, to tell you the characteristics of uh, smart uh, contracts too much into uh, detail. Smart contract follows a chosen program uh, logics. Uh, the execution of a smart contract is determined by the code, by the transactional uh, logic. Since transactions on the blockchain cannot be reversed, the adaptation of the terms of a contract is hardly possible and uh, the performance is in principle uh, digital. Contrary to what I uh, said throughout my uh, presentation, smart contracts can obviously not only be used um, in the financial um, sector, but uh, even better, uh, partly even better, in uh, other uh, sectors uh, such as um, for identity, uh, determination than uh, for uh, supply chains. I guess uh, this is probably one of the most promising uh, examples, supply chains in agriculture, but also um, uh, diamonds, uh, precious uh, metals, etc. Smart contracts for records for uh, financial data um, recording. Then there are discussions about smart contracts for land title and for mortgage. Um, Recording, um, Estland, Estonia um, is having such kind of uh, project, Ghana as well, due to the fact that Ghana does not know so far a traditional land uh, register. And we do have, and that's maybe the area in which you are most involved, smart contracts in the insurance industry, travel insurance, for example, just to mention names without personal affiliation. East Risk uh, is offering travel insurance based on uh, smart contracts or uh, uh, FISI from uh, OXA. And furthermore, um, since we are in Zurich, I do have to mention that reinsurance uh, business is trying to bring the contracts uh, on the blockchain by way of smart contracts through the IAG is domiciled in the Trust uh, uh, Square Center at uh, the beginning of uh, Bahnhofstrasse and is trying to launch the project for um, reinsurance uh, contracts. Smart contracts uh, uh, are uh, often called as neither smart nor a contract. That's maybe a, some kind of an ironical uh, remark, but if we look uh, at the legal situation, we uh, cannot come around the fact that some basic um, legal understandings do not really play for smart contracts, because usually it is said a co contract is uh, concluded in case of meeting of the minds, but people uh, in most cases do not uh, understand what contract language in a smart contract is saying. It's too technical and uh, translation uh, into words is not uh, possible. So lawyers uh, uh, work with analogies and uh, insofar no objection has been raised against uh, such analogies and in fact we do even have an unchitral uh, model law um, saying that uh, conduct of parties can also be considered as a meeting of minds and insofar as smart contracts uh, is, uh, are concerned, I would uh, indeed uh, think that this principle of conduct of parties uh, should be uh, applicable. As you can see from uh, this slide, I'm not a lawyer who advocates for more legal provisions. I think law can in fact uh, deal with smart contracts. There might be some minor um, uh, amendments in law which should be considered in case of illegality situations. Um, uh, for example, uh, in particular the question whether for certain contracts a requirement of implementing an oracle should be foreseen in law, an oracle which leads to an arbitration library or to whatever other kind of arbitration uh, panel. And uh, as a lawyer, I would also like to express the wish 
that perhaps uh, standardization organizations should look um, in, uh, to the development of specific standards for uh, smart uh, contracts. So concluding uh, my presentation, I uh, may say hopefully uh, somehow the legal details were not too cumbersome because my uh, conclusion is uh, in fact that we don't need uh, too many legal changes and basically we can try to live with the uh, legal provisions which we already have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rolf. <laughs> Questions? Please, Arthur. Um, I'm really sorry, I, I didn't fully catch your question. You're you are talking about the fintech li license outside of... There's no FinCEN in the U.S., so the organization for money is in the U.S. So FinCEN. He's talking about FinCEN. FinCEN, the FinCEN in the US, yeah. Yeah, uh, frankly speaking, uh, I'm not uh, fully uh, aware of these guidelines, and uh, in fact, I have not, I have not uh, read them. Uh, if you talk about custodial and uh, um, non-custodial uh, uh, activities on the uh, Swiss uh, finance law, it would be a question whether custodial um, services could be considered as holding deposits, and then it will be critical because this could have um, the consequence that banking law um, uh, would apply. But at least uh, due to the fact that the holding period has been prolonged from seven to 60 days, uh, certain business transactions uh, could be um, uh, executed within the 60 days, or the provider would have to see to it that it wouldn't hold uh, the assets uh, longer than 59 days. But okay. again, I'm sorry I cannot really make sure, a statement sure. to these guidelines. No, no problem. My second question was, um, so there is this classification among three token types, but this only holds at the moment that you do the ICO, right? And uh, the life cycle of, an I of a token can be much longer than just the initial selling period. So, in particular, in this decentralized systems, um, what if some anonymous entity starts using, a, for example, a payment token as a security token? What would then happen? Well, of, of course, um, uh, the guidelines mainly address uh, the issues of tokens, and if a token is to be qualified as a payment token, uh, at the time uh, of uh, issues, for example, um, financial market uh, authority license would not be required, and uh, the respective startup uh, could go on um, with the um, uh, activities. However, and the transfer of these uh, uh, tokens could also be done without having obtained a uh, trading license because payment tokens are a currency um, and uh, for currencies you don't need a license. However, if you change um, the quality of a token and maybe at the third or fourth step uh, the payment token becomes an asset token, then all of a sudden uh, the trading of the asset token could become subject uh, for example, to the new uh, DLT uh, trading system license. And that will then be the responsibility of those people who trade uh, a newly established asset token, having been changed from the previous character as a payment token. Mm -hmm. Is there any other question? Which gives, eh, but I still have one. I will go there in a second. A very short one. What happens, and links to the previous presentation by uh, Professor Berenstein, what happens when 
there is no finality or the consensus mechanism cannot be is not working right with the asset the crypto asset transfers what does the law say about it or nothing well for the time being the law doesn't say anything at all and <laughs> and uh, i mean uh, the, the question uh, always goes back uh, to the determination of some kind of contractual relationship uh, if somebody is uh, offering a digital asset and the digital um, asset does not have all the qualities which it should have, then uh, this could cause um, a liability. In theory, we also would mm -hmm. have tort liability um, if uh, on, on somebody is, is really misusing a system without contractual relationship. But I mean, that's somehow... Um, very traditional application mm -hmm. of existing um, rules. But I'm not saying that this would not lead to a satisfactory result, because, I mean, we, we do have experience with non-functioning software, yeah. for example, and yeah. we know who eventually could become uh, liable Liable. if uh, software uh, does not really function. I see. I see. Final question then. All right. The name is Gero Dittmann with IBM Research here in Zurich. Um, I was wondering about the standardization of smart contracts that you mentioned. Um, I can only guess that such standardization happens for traditional um, legal contracts outside of the blockchain context. Can you comment on which bodies would do such standardization? Computer. Well, um, in fact, it, it uh, uh, happens in traditional contracts, on, uh, and this is the case for many, many years, for example. Um, the uh, ISDA uh, contracts for um, uh, for um, uh, certain contract uh, uh, um, types, uh, uh, such as um, derivatives and uh, other uh, contracts, uh, have been developed, uh, as I said, some time ago by a London organization and even. Um, if two Swiss banks enter, for example, into a swap contract, they would use these ISDA uh, rules. If you ask me about organizations uh, which uh, could do some work um, in the context of smart contracts, I mainly think of the International Standardization Organization, the ISO, and, of course, the regional or, or the national chapters. In fact, I know that the Australian uh, standardization organization has submitted the request and even submitted certain proposals. I uh, also have heard that the uh, German standardization organization belonging to the ISO is interested to go forward, but for the time being, movements are relatively slow. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank you very Once much, the Rolf, again. Um, then yeah. we... I'm sorry, I have to... Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, then the final presentation of this uh, morning session is by... Okay, you have also your connector. Uh, it's by Professor Brian Ford from the EPFL, uh, where he heads the Decentralized and Distributed Systems Group. He earned his PhD at MIT, and he's focusing broadly on building secure decentralized systems, uh, being one of the most active uh, researchers in, there, in, in this country, and having been articulated uh, national initiatives as well. Uh, Brian, thank you very much for coming, day, doing this day trip to us, and also for your short, uh, the, given the short time that you also had today. So we really appreciate your presence. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks a lot. Great, great to be here. Um, so I'm here basically to switch you into the uh, computer science perspective. So, um, a very different uh, perspective, but uh, but very complementary. And one of the things I love about the blockchain area is the way it uh, is a really uh, fundamentally inter interdisciplinary problem that brings a lot of different uh, people with different perspectives together. So. Yeah, like Claudia said, I lead the Decentralized and Distributed Systems Lab at EPFL, uh, and I've been doing decentralized research of different kinds for about 20 years now, long before blockchain was a thing, uh, but uh, got into blockchain uh, research a few years ago when I moved to EPFL. But why, why do I uh, do blockchain research in the first place? Well, 
uh, actually for a somewhat different reason than probably many, many other people do. Uh, for me, I come from a security privacy uh, background, and so I kind of bring a security privacy perspective uh, to it. And a lot of my work is motivated by what, what I see as one of the grand challenges of uh, security and privacy, the fact that most of our information systems, computers and networks, are built on what we call a weakest link security model. You, an attacker has to just break one system, one credential, one weak link uh, to take the whole system down or cause a, a, a massive data breach. Um, and as our systems get bigger and more complex, these weakest link chains grow longer and more fragile. So our, uh, our security and our privacy scales the wrong direction with, our, uh, 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 with the size and functionality of our systems. And that's you know, just a very fundamental flaw. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of my long-term grand challenges and uh, that a lot of uh, security privacy people are working on is to figure out how we can redesign and re rethink systems to fix this, to, change, to shift our systems from weakest link security to strongest link security, where, where an attacker would have to break multiple links in order to, in order to get any benefit, right? And ultimately, we want to turn, uh, you know, turn, uh, turn the game around so that our security gets better as our systems get bigger, as we get more participants and more complex uh, interactions and data. We want that to, to, to work for us in, instead of against us. And fortunately, there have, you know, for a long, long time, long before blockchain, there have been relevant computer science algorithms to help with that. Um, but, uh, uh, but, uh, the pro that promise is, I think, one of the most Im uh, important and interesting things about uh, the blockchain topic. So just to very briefly introduce, uh, so my lab uh, uh, has, um, uh, uh, the work I'll be talking about is, of course, mostly the work of my lab members, PhD students, and software engineers especially. Um, but of course, I'm here to talk about blockchain, right? Uh, you know, everybody's uh, excited about blockchain. Uh, for many, many different reasons. Of course, you know, Bitcoin kind of started this in 2008. Um, you know, why am I interested in it? Well, to me, the most exciting thing about Bitcoin you know, from a security privacy perspective was that it actually showed an architecture that can scale security, that can, that can scale a strongest link uh, uh, security model in such a way that the more participants you add, at least in principle, if things are working right, which they don't always, but uh, uh, you know, in principle, as the uh, you know, more participants join you know, the Bitcoin or the right uh, well-designed cryptocurrency or blockchain ecosystem, security gets better. Uh, because the threshold of attack, uh, of successful attack, gets higher, right? Um, and Bitcoin showed that you could actually do this, and you could scale it, and, and kind of um, brought this uh, to the rest of the world. And so that's, that's super important and super exciting. Of course, blockchains uh, are useful for all kinds of applications. That's not uh, mainly the, uh, the topic of this talk. Uh, uh, other people are uh, uh, talking about that. On the other hand, today's blockchains, both permissioned and permissionless, also have a lot of li limitations. And those limitations are what I, as a computer science researcher, see as a big gold mine of opportunity, which is why I like to uh, uh, work in this space, right? So just to give you a high-level overview of the kind of uh, things my group does, we're trying to build a you know, uh, next-generation, much better uh, type of blockchain infrastructure. So our code, you can, you can get much of our code on GitHub. It's, it's open source. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's working. It's not necessarily very uh, uh, the most refined and clean. You know, it's, it's uh, still early research code. Uh, but, but a lot of what I'll be talking about is, uh, is actually working in some form. And, and we're working on making it working better. Um, we're trying to make blockchains much faster, more scalable, more privacy preserving, uh, more highly available, more, uh, more usable in different uh, troublesome contexts, and also more equitable. And so I'll, I'll get into what this means later in the talk. Um, but through all our work, we really focus on a security privacy perspective, which is why we've been uh, publishing element, uh, many elements of our blockchain architecture in, uh, in the top security privacy uh, uh, conferences. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and I, I would really like to see the many blockchain ventures and startups do more of this as well, 
uh, it might make it a little bit uh, easier to separate the, you know, the scams from the, uh, uh, from the actual, uh, uh, you know, meaningful, uh, you know, strong technical uh, ideas out there. So, um, so let's, uh, uh, you know, I, can't, I sef- certainly can't talk about everything my group's doing, and, and each of the topics I'll touch on, I'll, I won't get into technical details, first of all, because there's no time, second, because most of you aren't computer scientists, uh, and, uh, and so, but I wanted just to talk about four, four main uh, uh, key challenges, scaling, privacy, resilience, and the stake problem, Okay. So to get right into it, let's first look at scaling. How do we make blockchains do enough fast enough, just enough transaction capacity? And of course, you know, Bitcoin has this well-known limitation of being limited to about 4.5 transactions per second. You can tweak it a little bit, uh, you know, with with quite a few uh, ways. Um, uh, And, you know, Ethereum has done that. Many variations uh, on current blockchain protocols have done that. But to get really huge uh, improvements in throughput and capacity, you need, to, you need to step back and rethink. And that's, that's the approach we wanted to take. Um, we started in this process with a project a few years ago called Bitcoin that basically um, uh, figured out uh, how to take classic uh, Byzantine consensus algorithms that's, that's been, that computer science has been uh, building for you know, 15, 20 years now, the, the, the uh, classic version of the Byzantine consensus uh, uh, pro- uh, problem is, uh, is very well studied, but what didn't really fit well into the uh, Bitcoin or blockchain model. We basically figured out how to fit them together, again, leaving out the details, um, and showed that if you can do that, you can, you can separate the, the notion of membership or stake, such as proof of work or proof of stake or anything like, else, separate that from the core consensus process, and then allow, allow the consensus to run much, much faster, get much higher, uh, hundreds of times higher throughputs uh, at, uh, at much lower, lower costs. So, so that was a good first step, but you know, we didn't want to stop there. Uh, so our more recent uh, scalability-focused uh, work is called OmniLedger, uh, which uh, appeared last year. Um, and this basically brings uh, the property that clouds ha- have had forever, n- namely scale out, uh, you know, brings that to blockchain. What is scale out? Well, it's the idea that as you add more participants, more hardware, invest more, in, um, uh, you should get more capacity around that, right? <laughs> and it's kind of absurd that Bitcoin does not have that, uh, that property. The more, capa- the more participants and hardware you throw at Bitcoin, it still has uh, 4.7 transactions per second limited you know, global, globally, right? And so uh, OmniLedger basically... Um, uh, is one of a number of approaches to, to scaling blockchains that, uh, uh, that uses sharding. Basically takes a large group of participants, uh, divides it uh, into random subgroups, each of which basically maintains a mini blockchain, right? And then, of course, there, there's a bunch of technical challenges that you have to address. One, uh, Alexander pointed out, uh, uh, randomness is indeed hard, uh, but, but for, fortunately it's a solvable hard problem. Um, so, uh, so that's an element here, uh, distri- uh, uh, distributed randomness, as well as, as ma- uh, maintaining consistency, handling atomic transactions that touch multiple uh, shards and multiple blockchains at once. But again, I won't get into the details, but uh, the upshot is that we can uh, get this just in our experimental networks. We can uh, really easily scale to you know, Visa Mas- uh, MasterCard levels of throughput. And uh, you know, these experiments are limited by our test bed, not by the scalability of the system. So you, you know, in principle, you could scale to as much ca- capacity as you want to throw to buy hardware or throw hardware at. So um, there's, of course, a lot of other interesting scaling. Uh, issues, but I'll leave it at that for now. Um, I w- instead, I want to move on to the, uh, uh, another important challenge, namely privacy. So in the standard blockchain model, you, you kind of by default assume anything you put on the blockchain is public, right? Of course, you can, you, you know, you can create private permission blockchains that, uh, that you know, try not to broadcast everything to er- everybody. But um, in any case, 
the, the basic blockchain model has a problem that, uh, that uh, you know, if you look at the, the classic, well, what's called the CIA model uh, in data protection uh, uh, practice, you have to care uh, uh, about at least three orthogonal data protection properties, confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Blockchains tend to be pretty good at strengthening integrity when they're working well. That's the whole idea. That's the whole idea of you know replicating a bunch of copies of a ledger and and using consensus to keep them in sync and immutable, right? So that's good. But if you care about confidentiality or availability, does a blockchain help you? Not necessarily. It might it might in fact make things worse, right? Um, in, in particular, when you're talking about con confidentiality, spreading around more copies of, uh, of anything means there's more points from which a, a copy of something secret or private could, uh, could leak, right? Um, and so, uh, without, again, without getting into too much details, another of our research projects has been figuring out how to re-architect re blockchains to use other well-known cryptographic tools, such as, uh, such as uh, Shamir secret sharing, uh, verifiable secret sharing and other things in the right way uh, to build blockchains that allow you to encrypt and entrust a secret to the blockchain uh, together with a policy that determines how it should be used, how it should be uh, you know, stored, when it should be forgotten, for example. Um, and ensure that that policy is enforced and that, that anything that uh, uh, is ever done with that secret is, uh, uh, is recorded, right? And, and the hard part is, is basically ensuring that, uh, again, the scalable, you get the scalability, scalable security property, the decentralization where the more participants you add, uh, the more security you get. Um, and so, so that's an uh, uh, interesting aspect of the work, too. Of course, this is only... Uh, kind of a step on the longer term privacy path, you know, being able to entrust secrets to a blockchain is great, but you also want to compute with them, you want to do interesting things with them, and that's the topic of, uh, uh, of another area of work that, uh, that we're working on, uh, being able to, to use technologies like uh, homomorphic encryption and secure multi-party computation uh, to process data uh, uh, that's encrypted on a blockchain without exposing it to any, any single party. Uh, and my lab is working uh, uh, closely with, for example, uh, with uh, Jean-Pierre Hubeau's uh, lab at EPFL, uh, specifically on applying this kind of thing to, uh, to uh, secure um, uh, handling and processing of medical data. Right? So, um, so that's a, a quick look at uh, uh, privacy uh, challenges and, uh, and uh, what we're trying to do on them. Let's talk about resilience and availability um, of, uh, of blockchains. So again, going back to the CIA triad, you know, we don't just care about integrity and confidentiality, we care about the availability of either the blockchain that you're depending on or the data that's, that's committed on it, right? Uh, and, and this is also complicated. And we've seen you know, uh, important questions arise. What if, what if you're depending on a blockchain something and that blockchain gets overloaded due, due to a load spike that's uh, out of your control? Or it's under a denial of service or bribery attack? I'll get, get, to that, uh, get to that in a minute. What happens if it's just unreachable from a client that really needs to refer to the blockchain to, to check a certificate or check, uh, check the validity of something? What if the uh, you know, blockchain and a, and a client relying on it are disconnected or eclipsed by an attacker? Or what if it's just too slow because, because say, you're, you're you know, paying speed of light latencies for, for going around the world for every transaction, right? And so these are, this is a whole big space of interesting challenges that I'll just briefly touch on. So how many of you uh, are familiar with the CryptoKitties uh, incident? For, for, yeah, yeah, great. So this is when, just purely by accident, no malicious intent, a super popular you know, game uh, a virtual cat uh, breeding application basically took over Ethereum and made it impossible for anything to get anyone to get any useful work done on the, uh, uh, on, on the blockchain for a while, right? Um, a somewhat less known, how many, how many people know about FOMO 3D? So, okay, good, a few. So this was a, uh, this was a literally a blockchain, a successful blockchain bribery a attack, right? So there was this, uh, th this uh, Ethereum smart contract that basically held a growing pot of gold. Anybody could, you know, put money into the contract and it would reset a timer, like uh, two minutes or something, right? And the contract said, well, wh whoever last, uh, you know, 
put, put money in there when it uh, expires gets the p whole pot. And so a lot of people, especially economists, thought, well, you know, this is never going to, people will keep putting money in and it's never going uh, to end. But it did because somebody figured out that if you swamp the Ethereum, if you just pay a lot of money to swamp the Ethereum blockchain with high value, high fee transactions that do nothing. They're just useless other than for, to squeeze out everybody else's transactions for two minutes or whatever. Then, and you know, the pocket pot of gold is big enough to justify that. Bam, you win. And that, that's what they did, right? So that's a successful, massive, you know, in, uh, economically incentivized denial of service or bribery attack against Ethereum, right? So very interesting, you know, challenges. How, how do we address them? You know, again, of course, our, our research group has only t uh, 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 looked at this, uh, a few particular problems. Uh, you know, the broader space is still very open and interesting. Um, so we, um, uh, a couple things uh, uh, we've looked at is how can, uh, you know, if you can't always get to a blockchain uh, in real time or immediately, how can you uh, uh, verify a transaction that's uh, been put on the blockchain before without, uh, without immediate access? Um, and, for, and for that purpose, we created a, a new cryptographic structure we call a, a skip chain, which basically allows cryptographic verification and time travel, uh, basically movement forward and backward on the blockchain efficiently. And, and you can kind of travel both forward and time or, or backward in time uh, very efficiently with this abstraction to kind of verify anything anywhere in the blockchain from any other point on the blockchain, right? And so we applied this in an in a end-to-end secure software update system called Chainiac we developed. Um, and it, it also might be useful for things like uh, certificates, supply chain applications, things like that, where you don't want your warehouse and all your operations to grind to a halt if your uh, client device temporarily can't, uh, can't actually reach the blockchain or can't, do some, can't get a transaction through, right? So that's a, that's a small step, but uh, more, more broadly, um, uh, you know, another thing we would really like is more of a locality property. Do we have to pay for, uh, you know, co for global coordination for everything we do, especially if the transactions we care about really are, are only meaningful within Switzerland or with, within Zurich or something like that? Can we build localized blockchains that ensure that if you're, uh, if you're operating in a local space, you get uh, very fast local latencies. And so we, we have a, uh, an ongoing project that's basically um, uh, uh, developing a way to do, to do that systematically and get, uh, get uh, uh, local and locally resilient accesses so that your local accesses uh, will not be affected, adversely affected by something that happens somewhere, in, uh, somewhere else in the world, right? Um, so, uh, so finally, uh, so, uh, I, I want to talk about the problem of stake and I don't mean just proof of stake. I mean, stake in a broad sense as in stakeholder, who are the stakeholders of a blockchain or any system? And this goes be about, uh, back to a very basic human organization problem that has had thousands of years of history to it. Namely, anytime you build any kind of uh, organization that tries to make decisions, you've got to have a way to decide who's a member, who gets voting power, and how much voting power does each member have in this decision-making process, right? And this is what this big, uh, you know, uh, what proof of work tries to address, as well as permission blockchains, proof of stake, proof of storage, many proof of star variations. Um, and, and so let's, let's uh, just quickly look at proof of work. Well, what is proof of work? It's a very interesting thing that I like to call proof by hazing ritual, right? So this is not new. We've always had, you know, organizations like fraternities that say, okay, to be a member, you just have to do something embarrassing or something painful, something that not everybody is going to be willing to do, right? So, you know, whatever it is, you know, MIT at one point decided they would uh, induct a, a member by ha using him to measure a bridge. And the markers are still there on the Massachusetts Mass Ave Bridge. So, you know, you can pick any, any hazing ritual you want as long as it's something is it's an artificial barrier to entry, and of course, Bitcoin's hazing ritual is digitally flipping coins, proving you, prove you wasted energy just to prove you wasted energy, right? And of course, you don't have, you, you can't just do this once to get permanent membership. You got to keep doing it constantly, forever, like Sisyphus, right? 
Um, and of course, you know, as has been pointed out, and I fully agree, this is an environmental disaster uh, in terms of energy use. You know, now that Bitcoin, this is uh, even already out of date, Bitcoin is using more energy than, you know, a very large number of, uh, of countries are using to live on. And are we getting good decentralization, good security? Well, unfortunately, no, because mining is so, has become so centralized for other fun economic reasons that, uh, that if you look at the number of, uh, of large miners, for example, that would have to collude to you know, do whatever they want with, uh, with uh, Bitcoin or other blockchains, the number tends to be very small. And not just for Bitcoin, but for pretty much all the, uh, all the cryptocurrencies, right? So, you know, what are the alternatives? We have alternatives like permissioned ledgers, just get some people in a room and decide who the members are, how, how you add and remove members, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That can work. Um, and there, I think it's a, a reasonable model when it's, uh, when it's implemented well and securely. Um, it has, you know, some limitations too. One is it's a manual process require, requiring, uh, requiring uh, you know, real people. It makes it not an open system anymore, obviously, but it also potentially, you know, in principle, weakens the, uh, the strongest link security you could in principle get. Now, you know, it's, it's hard to say that we're getting better security with Bitcoin than with a well-designed pre uh, permission le ledger, given Bitcoin's super centralization too. You know, it's actually pretty bad both ways at the moment. But uh, but this is a, a, an issue in principle. So what, are, what other um, prospects do we have? Of course, proof of stake, which uh, 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 we've already seen. And that's a super interesting uh, problem. It, uh, it's interesting from an economic perspective. It's also interesting from a computer science perspective. Uh, there are reasonable uh, proof of stake algorithms uh, uh, out there. I think, you know, from a computer science research perspective, pr proof of stake is totally doable. Pretty much a solved problem now, I think. Uh, mostly a deployment uh, and uh, an incremental improvement problem. But if we think about you know, what proof of stake means, what are you accomplishing? Well, you're basically building an automated version of a shareholder corporation, right? Which, you know, nothing wrong with that, but that's what you get, right? And having, you know, a shareholder corporation in which people can buy stock and use it to vote is, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, one way to manage stake, but, all, but it's also not going necessarily going to ensure reliable de decentralization, for, uh, right? You know, for the same reason, shareholders, uh, corporations are vulnerable to hostile takeovers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So... And this is because all of these, you know, proof of star that we've been talking about are just different variants on proof of investment, proof of, you know, investing this, invest that, invest something else, right? So one of, one of my um, long-term uh, projects that I feel is, you know, most important and most interesting as well as challenging is can we get a true, reliable, long-term uh, notion of decentralization that's truly inclusive and sustainable and empowering from a, 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 in terms of its, its effect and usability by people, right? Can we build a people-centric uh, blockchain that remains decentralized and doesn't re-centralize because of different kinds of uh, variants of rich get richer uh, effects, right? And so that's the goal of a sub-project uh, that my lab is working on called Proof of Personhood. Can we build blockchain structures and decentralized systems that give each real person one and only one uh, uh, unit of state, right? Not related to investment, but related to personhood, right? Now, this means it somehow fundamentally has to tie be tied to real people. How do you do that, right? And that's a hard problem too, especially doing it securely in a usable fashion. Etc. There's various ways that you know we've looked at that uh, other people are looking at. Um, you know, I won't talk about them. Uh, uh, um, uh, one of the uh, ways that uh, my group is uh, is is working on developing is uh, based on an old idea uh, I had a number of years, over ten years ago, called pseudonym parties, which uh, which is that we actually leverage physical gatherings like this, and we've been we, we've been running the uh, some of these experimentally back at EPFL and in other places which is basically you, you know, get people in a room who you know, want, a, want a stake token you know, for some period of time. You say, well, you've got to show up. That's the cost. You know, show up in person. Prove you're a real person by using your physical body to prove presence. Right? Um, 
And, uh, and you basically have to be there at a particular time. After the gong sounds, you can leave. You get one token as you leave, but you can't come back in, right? And, and you can't get another token uh, until the next, uh, next time period, right? Um, and so it basically uses the physical security property that as physical people, we have only one body each for now, right? We haven't perfected cheap cloning yet. So, you know, that, that'll break pseudonym parties, but... Uh, um, so, and, you know, I'm super happy that, you know, Switzerland, this, this you know, kind of perfectly fits in Switzerland in a way, because at least certain Swiss cantons have this great tradition of gathering for other reasons, uh, you know, physically in town squares or something to, to, for direct democracy. Um, and, and, and it's not so, such an unfamiliar process in other parts of the world where there's, you know, regular political, uh, you know, people show up or don't show up just to make a statement or go to parties and festivals of different kinds or, or you know, once a week or once a month or even once a day uh, uh, gather for, for religious ceremonies. So there's a lot of, you know, reasonable reasons people tend to gather Anyway, so the question is, can we leverage those to create a personhood-based foundation uh, for decentralization? And if we could, there's a lot of things we could do with it. Uh, so I, you know, I, won't, I, I won't go through this, but uh, you know, lot, lots of very interesting things we could do with that. We could have smart contracts that know about people that, could, that hand out rewards or coupons or, or, or things one per person, you know, which would be uh, uh, useful. We could build things like crypto uh, uh, universal, uh, universal basic income that you know, anyone could opt into and doesn't have to be tied to a, a particular jurisdiction. Right, which would be very, very interesting. I, I am, uh, assume, legally and uh, interesting as well. But you know, I'm, uh, I'll ask the experts on that. Um, and you know, ultimately, uh, I, I feel like we need some some notion of decentralized di digital citizenship uh, that we can actually build future blockchains and cryptocurrencies on. And that's you know one of the grand challenges I see, and I and you know that we're working on is very much a work in progress. But, um, but of course, you know, it's, it's in a space of very interesting um, uh, approaches to stake and other problems in blockchain, right? So that's a, that's a summary. Sorry if I went uh, uh, over a couple minutes. Um, uh, we've, uh, uh, so I've talked about several of our projects. Um, uh, like I mentioned, the code is available. Quite a few companies, and we have quite a few partners using it and other, other people uh, using our stuff. It's, it's uh, in use in projects like the, the Digital Personalized Health Project, the Swiss Data Science Center, um, it's uh, um, uh, other, other uh, uh, startups, and we're even voting with it at EPFL now. So uh, we have an internal e-voting system based on this uh, uh, next generation blockchain architecture. So uh, in conclusion, what we're trying to do, like I said, we're trying to build next generation blockchain systems, get better, strongest link security, more scalable, and uh, more privacy preserving, uh, and, and uh, ultimately, hopefully, more connected to real people and more equitable. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, if, if there's time for questions, I'll be yeah. happy to. Thank you very much, you. Brian, for your presentation. <laughs> Questions? Please, Jorn. Thank you for your brilliant uh, presentation. I've got okay. one question. When you identify people through this method, uh, count or giving them tokens when they leave the room, um, how can you prevent that they sell the token to the highest bidder? Yeah, great, uh, great question. So in the, in the basic... Um, in, in terms of achieving the basic security property that's at the, the heart of what we are trying to achieve, that's actually not a problem. So, for example, if you're using this to create crypto universal basic income or something like that, that's, it's per perfectly fine if they're selling their token. That's just one of many ways, to, you know, they could instead print the currency and sell the currency, you know, they print for fiat money and they're just being an exchange. Right? So in certain applications, in many applications, it's not a problem. The, 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 security object, the core security objective is to solve the Sybil attack, make sure that no legitimate person can, can create two or five or a thousand uh, tokens rather than just one. 
right? So that's actually not a violation of the basic core security properly. Now, on the other hand, there are some ap applications we would love to use it for in which that is a problem, namely voting, what, you know, in do democracy, the kind of thing that applications that a lot of people think about. That's one of many applications. And for that, actually, we do have um, uh, coercion resistance mechaniz uh, mechanisms in mind, uh, ways in which, yeah, you can't prevent people from transferring, uh, you know, a token, uh, say, a voting token or, or, or something like that. But you can, you can, uh, you know, if somebody's trying to buy your voting to token, we can create mechanisms to make it uh, so that the person who's buying it doesn't know if they, if you stayed bought, if you, if they actually got a good token or a bad one, or uh, you know, if if their vote actually counts or not, for example, uh -huh. right? So, so that's that's an interesting and hard problem associated with certain applications, but you know, we don't actually need to solve that problem in order to solve the basic Sybil attack problem. And and and, and you, of, of course, you rely uh, on the people that hand out the tokens. You have to trust them. So the. Yes and no. So, so that's, a, that's a complicated question we should probably take offline. I, I'll be happy to talk uh, further about that uh, uh, afterwards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the critiques that you have was towards um, you know, the centralization of the mining process with Bitcoin. But I think <coughs> many people make a mistake there. Uh, because in economics, basically, what you really have to look at whether this market is contestable, right? whether there's free entry and that quite often kind of forces actually, the, say, the monopolist or mm -hmm. the duopoly to yeah. behave mm -hmm. properly. Yep. And I think this is very similar in, in, in Bitcoin. Absolutely. And, then, and, 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 and we've seen... Now I have a question. Oh, okay. This was just yeah. a comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was very <coughs> unclear to me, because you, ca you said, okay, you have this 7,000 transaction or whatever. I know of many other blockchains, they also claim this, and it's probably true, but they're all kind of some sort permissioned. Mm -hmm. So is this a yeah. totally open thing and everybody can come in, be validators? And so it's, yeah, there's a good question. It's, <laughs> it's relatively easy to get thousands of transactions per second if you're using classic Byzantine or non-Byzantine. Many, many of these blockchains don't even bother getting Byzantine consensus. They use Apache Zookeeper or something like that which is, you know, completely throws away the no single point of compromise, uh, you know, property. Um, but, you know, if, you're, if you use classic consensus in a very small group, you know, with good locality in the same data center, you know, in the same rack or something, it's really easy to get thousands of transactions per second. It's a lot harder to get that at, you know, at global latencies with global coordination among thousands or tens of thousands of participants. And so that's, uh, that's where uh, I think OmniLedger achieves something that's not, you know, not so easy that, not, that all of these, uh, you know, permission blockchains aren't uh, routinely achieving, right? I don't know, you know, I'm it's not familiar non, with all of them. You say it's non-permission, so everybody can participate. So, it, so OmniLedger, the, the, the sharding and consensus process is uh, agnostic uh, in, independent of the stake or membership mechanism, right? So it could be used, it, uh, it could be driven uh, in a permissionless way, for example, using proof of work or proof of stake um, uh, in, in the way that Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin did, our, our first uh, project in this space, it basically decoupled those two processes. So you can define your participants and consensus groups using proof of stake or proof of work or, or a permissioned uh, process, uh, the, the, you know, the, the consensus and, and uh, uh, sharding process kind of doesn't care. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other question? And this is the last from this session. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I found thank it very you. interesting. Um, I'm a bit new to this, so forgive my question if it no. seems misguided. Um, I have a question about the proof of person parameter. So, um, can something like Godel numbering, like as used in the incompleteness theorems, the Godel's incompleteness theorems, where you where you assign something like security or social security number for sentences, let's say, can that be adopted, for example, to facilitate satisfying the proof of person parameter within a blockchain context where you have a precise numerical, um, let's say, expression identifying each participating person, let's say, a, so, as, as a unique way of referring to mm. them? I'm not sure if that will work, just a question. So that, if you, so, um, 
So it sounds like you're asking a variant of the question, can, can you use tradition, leverage traditional IDs, like you know, social security numbers are a government-assigned you know, numeric ID, ID right. space, right? right. But and so you know, but, certainly there's a lot, yeah, lot yeah, of ways exactly. to use traditional IDs. It sounds like what you're suggesting is literally use a, a numeric space like the social ID space. You know, it has a certain number of digits. Obviously, there can be at most a certain number of people with social security numbers until you have to make them bigger, right? And so, yeah, for, from a you know, <coughs> very rough approximation perspective, you could do that numerically. Um, I wouldn't recommend it because uh, it would be, you know, extremely insecure in, on a number of fronts. Uh, you know, for one thing, just because if you're relying on just the size of that space for a civil attack resistance perspective, I, you know, I'm not sure how many social security numbers are in use versus the number that uh, that, that space has, but I, I bet the factor is huge, and that factor is what, say, you know, a clever insider or a civil attacker could use to, you know, vastly magnify the number of fake IDs they, they can print, right? And so, um, yeah, so you could do that kind of thing, and you can do other things with, with legacy IDs, but they have all the security problems of legacy IDs and then some privacy problems too, et cetera, right? So. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you very much for thank the you. audience mm -hmm. for the nice questions.